New books from Our Daddy in November. The Magic Corridor, American Jesus and Prodigy. Coming in January, ne- Nemenis Reloaded. It looks so nasty. Art by Jorge Jimenez. Before that is Nightclub in December by Mark Miller and Juanan Ramirez. Do you think comics are too expensive? So do we. Every issue, just $1.99. Rob Liefeld, first published in his teens, record-breaking Marvel book, image founder, co-creator of Deadpool and Cable. I love Rob, one of the smartest pros. I check out his feed every day. For me, that's what I do instead of a news site now. I go and just see what's happening with Rob. Although this week I've tried to stay away so that it's all kind of fresh, so that I don't know what you're thinking this week. you know. But Rob, brilliant to see you as always. Great to see you, Mark. You know how much I love you. I, I, You are one of the few people I like and respect in, in the biggest possible way. I, you, are a, you are a fiery, like, dynamo, and I love it. I love it. Listen, I remember, I loved you before I met you, obviously. You know, um, I remember you coming on the scene. It was just, like, the most exciting thing in the world. You know, like, when there's a, a new music thing or a new wave of TV or, or film and everything, you know, like... You came on, you were a guy about my age doing the kind of thing I wanted to do and everything. Yeah. It was so cool. And we were in all these different countries around the world. It's like the X-Men, you know, but one day we all came together and we all kind of met. It was great, you know? So like, uh, I'm I'm loving that we can hang out over Zoom because it's been, what, five years since I've seen you in person, probably. Yes, it's been yes, a while, sir. Right? At least, at the very least, yes. And comics, comics unites us, Mark. Our exactly. passion. And it, it's so weird, isn't it? Because... Comic guys do always get on. I know I know it doesn't seem like it, you know, where you kind of see it on Twitter and everything, but see if you sit two comic people, whether they're pros or fans, whatever, yeah. you sit them together, they have everything in common, haven't they? They just, yes. they always get on. I've sat in five-hour plane rides with comic guys I've I've only just met on the plane and we become best friends, you know? It's, isn't it's nuts, isn't it? And that's so good. Yes, cool. there, there are tribes within the business, but everybody has a connective thing, instant, instant connection. It's great, it's great. But listen, you know what I'm curious about as well? You know, I mean, thanks for doing this, but I've always wondered, I'm always fascinated by this. What's your day like? like what do you, from the minute you get up, <laughs> and you, I, I, I can tell you. I love this because I remember Stephen King only writes four hours a day and that blew my mind. Okay. I was like, I assumed he sat and wrote all day, you know? And I know some guys work at nighttime, some guys work at day. Yeah. Tell me Rob Liefeld's day. No, my day is, Mark, I wake up really early. I wake up sometime between 4.30 a.m. and 5 a.m. Pacific. Yeah. I, I, I really can't get beyond five hours sleep and haven't probably for the last decade. So um, I also, I remind everybody and everybody in my family knows this. I'm not ashamed to say I take old man in the afternoon naps, okay? They're generally, they can, they're never longer than 12 or 15 minutes. Um, So I'm instantly able to, re, you know, re-energize, but- I'm up working early. Uh, I like to draw early because yeah. I just, it's, uh, you just, just c- kind of get the bulk of your day's requirements out of the way. So, so for majority of days, I'm drawing early. I always break uh, five days a week. I ride my bike. I have a stationary bike. I, I, I watch the news. I, I ride it from about uh, anywhere from 9 30 to 10 AM to, you know, 10 30, nine, you know, Somewhere between nine and eleven, that that gets done. Uh, Mark, I have giant bean bags in my house. I generally am not at a desk. I have two giant bean bags, uh, three, but one is at mine. And I plop down. I have I draw with a a the same uh, drawing board that I've drawn for thirty years. Yeah, uh, it's got all manner of ink and paint and white out and all over it. But I I I do not really work at a traditional desk, and so I plop down. In the morning, I'm on the couch. In the morning yeah. when I wake up, I, I just kind of go get my stuff. I draw on the couch. I'm listening to the news. I work out. I then get on the beanbag. I draw into the afternoon. I take a lunch. Now, during the summer, I yeah. take a long lunch. I go to yeah. the pool every day. Uh, I For six months out of the year, uh, March, April, May, June, July, August, I am in my pool. I love my pool. Um, and, and you know what? The great thing is you roll calls all day in the pool where I'm talking comics all <laughs> afternoon, you know? But then once I'm done... I re-engage in the afternoons. Yeah. And uh, then in the fall, like my like my kids were asking me yesterday, because none, none of them live with me right now. And uh, they're all ch- asking me how things are going. And I said, well, I'm getting a lot more done on the fall schedule because there's you take away pool time. 
And so I'm back in the beanbag <laughs> in the afternoon. Yeah. I start winding down around four o'clock. So I've been working from six, six for three out in a three hour block. Then after workout, another kind of three, four, maybe five hours and I'm done. And then, then I, then, but you know, this never turns off. Yeah. This is always, you know, percolating. And uh, even on the bike again, I mean, I answered uh, uh, messages from my attorney today on yeah. a couple of different deals. I talked to the printer, you know, even when you're working out, you know, on a stationary bike, which I've been doing for 30 plus years, you're, you're, you know, with the iPad, you're always doing stuff. So that is my, um, now, now, now there's days I have a podcast I've been doing for two and a half years yeah. and I record those generally on Mondays and this morning. Yeah. I woke up today's morning. I woke up at six, turned the mic on and I recorded uh, for about 95 minutes yeah. tomorrow's yeah. podcast that'll go everywhere. Uh, it's Rob's observations. If you don't know, Rob's observations is on Apple, Spotify, Podbean, all the plat, all the platforms. So I have really become dedicated and disciplined in that because I have to hand, hand it off to my sound engineer who cleans it up before he posts it. That is my answer. I think it's funny. We all wake up about 5 a.m. I'm the same. Yeah. And Johnny Romita, Johnny Romita is up at four and he's working out for two hours and eats a steak yeah. and kills an animal or something like that, you know, yeah, before sure, he starts sure, drawing. Sure. But sure. I, I think you have to have that crazy self-discipline, don't you? Because probably the yeah. reputation of comic guys is we lie around eating chips all day watching TV and everything, but we're not. We're, we're up early and our, our brains oh. are wearing, aren't they? I think that's that's the curse and the gift, isn't it? You're waking up so early because you're so excited about your day. Well, and Mark, you're, you, you clearly are a similar... Um, discipline and you always have been i mean i was very impressed early on when i you know came to know you as a fan i mean i did not know you until i know you in the knew you in the pages of the comics and i could not believe the workload that you took on and the fact that it was at a i mean this guy's operating at a high bar mark i'm going to tell you i haven't known anybody to do as many books and as many books well because i i do i speak to you as a fan i, I i'm really bold people know this this is for my podcast there's only two guys in the 2000s for the last 20 years and i'll fight you on this you're going to disagree because you're going to want to add and add some of your friends screw that shit it's robert kirkman and mark miller it's mark miller and robert kirkman those are the dynamos those are the dynamos of the 2000s okay those are the guys who knocked down the door saw every opportunity took it had the talent to back it up worked in different genres you know and blew people's minds. And there was a lot of contenders to the throne. Many, many of your rivals were placed on a throne. Yeah. We, we want you to be the king. And then that, like the king, the throne kept cutting them just like in house of dragon. You don't belong <laughs> on the throne. And it kicked them off. Right. And, then, and here's the deal. You know what guys like the image guys, myself, you, uh, uh, you know, Robert, you made your own kingdom. You're like, I don't want that throne. I got bigger things in mind. So, <laughs> You know, I, I know I'll how I know how disciplined and how much you work. So it, it's it's I benefited from it because I read all of it. I, I'll take any praise, but especially praise from you. I'll, I'll I'll take that praise, you know. But like, uh, but it's funny because I, I love your Twitter feed. Like I say, it's honest. You know, with some yeah. some people's Twitter feed. I mean, mine isn't even done by me anymore. I gave it over to the marketing team. You know, like <laughs> every, everybody kind of you know tries to play the game and they're political and everything. But what I love about yours is you're always honest. You know, if something's good, you say it. If something's bad, you kind of try. That's, right. Truth, That's you know? right. And and I love that. That's what Twitter's supposed to be, isn't it? That freedom of speech thing and everything. But I've stayed away from it this week because I'm just I wanted it to be fresh, like I say. But I'm curious. Yeah. Have you seen Black Adam? Did you go and see Black Adam? I, I so so I have been very honest, Mark. I went to see Spider-Man No Way Home. Yeah. I went to the premiere in three weeks. It'll be a year. Yeah. Uh, it was so weird because we were kind of coming out of COVID and it was the most star-studded event that I had been to as far as premiere since Endgame. Yeah. And then COVID went ramped up for the holiday season and the yeah. crap, the, the thing that cracked me up and a bunch of people who I stood next to at yeah. the premiere, celebrities had COVID the next day it was announced. <laughs> well, I, have, I have never had COVID. I have never been diagnosed. I have not been sick for yeah. three years. Um, But like, it was just so funny because No Way Home, it didn't matter because, you know, I think the world, but the America went into a giant COVID surge last Christmas but it didn't stop people from packing it in. Mark, yeah. I did not. I, I got off a of moon night halfway yeah. through Disney plus. I have yeah. not seen what if I have not seen she Hulk. I have not seen Ms. Marvel. I have not seen Dr. Strange. I have not seen Thor love and thunder. I will not see black Adam. Um, I, I will go back next week and I will see Wakanda forever. Yeah, I will. see. But I feel like I just took a pass on the year. I just, um, 
I, I feel like there's a different end game represented a culmination of 10 years of real brilliance. Yeah. But uh, as they reset the chairs um, and, you know, I've, I've, I'm, I'm very, you said I'm honest. I don't know how to be any other way. It Look, Bob Iger, before he left Disney, clearly Disney Plus was a giant, uh, you know, undertaking and priority for them. And he went in to Kevin Feige and said, yeah. hey, thanks for those three movies a year. I need I need six shows now, too. So, you know, how you were doing eight hours for us because these movies are kind of three hours, two and a half hours. Well, now I need 100 hours. I need yeah. 80 hours. Yeah. And, and, and so the product got thinned out. I've talked to some people uh, from Disney in regards to specifically like what's going on with Deadpool three. Yeah. And there are, there are relatively new people yeah. who are, who are new, who are learning the Feige system. And yeah. there may be, there may be three circles out of the inner circle. Yeah. Um. So this year's products, I felt Um. if I catch them, I catch them. If I don't, I don't, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to see Wakanda forever for literally. I, I, I know I'm going to be deeply moved because of the, like I said on my podcast, we will be feeling Chadwick's loss along with the characters. It's a, it's going to be a weird, cathartic, like, like that Heath Ledger Joker thing. Mm -hmm. We lost him as a talent, and and but but in the movie he's also passed away. Yeah. But dude, Prince Namor, Submariner has I'm been impressed. my jam my yeah. whole life. Yeah. I love him. I cannot wait to see him on screen. Yeah. I like how they've tweaked him. Yeah. And I'm I'm ready to. To take that ride. So, Mark, what about you? Do you watch this stuff? Well, do you know it's weird? Like, I went to see Superman four like five times in the cinema, yeah. right? I went to see the Phantom, the Rocketeer, all the low level, all the low hanging fruit, everything. Comic book yeah. movie. I'm there first day, and I was the same. I'm exactly the same. Endgame was fantastic. I loved it. I mean, it ended on such a high for me. But we lost yeah. Stan at that time. Tony Stark dies in the movie. The movie's called Endgame, and it brings to a close everything. And I, I kind of checked out. You know, and yes. I, I never thought I would say that. None of the TV shows actually no. have me even watching them. I'm not even checking them out. But the same things happen with Star Wars too. And this isn't two middle-aged guys talking. Like my kids are the same. No. My kids are like, I want to no. watch something else now. You know, it's like it just it feels yeah. like that moment has passed. But I don't think comic book adaptations are gone. You know, because it's like novels, isn't it? It's just a it's a medium as opposed to a genre. You know, so like uh, mm. I love the fact that comics can be anything now so maybe the marvel leaders come to a bit of a close you know star wars kind of has a little bit for me as well you know but i'm ready for loads of new stuff now i think so, i'm hungry so for something new uh the new show by tony gilroy and or is very mature and yeah. and i i was at a you know an adult halloween party with a bunch of old men like me and, and that sounds movie. creepy that sounds really creepy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well none of us have kids at home everybody I mean, yeah we, we were, let me let me let me also back up it was halloween night no one dressed up we're all yeah. just hanging out because all of our kids are gone right. but i'm like um but but a bunch of guys were griping that they didn't like andor and i'm like you just don't like it because it's not lightsabers and sith lords but andor is tinker taylor soldier spy yeah. in space it's a heist it's oceans 11 it's going to be a prison break and I like it because it's elevated and Mark, what has to happen in the superhero space. Yeah. And I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. And now my 22 year old son and my 20 year old son are experiencing what I did. What yeah. you did what we, we moved away from star Wars and into aliens, into blade runner, yeah. into, uh, into RoboCop, into predator, yeah. into total recall, the R rated space comics. Yeah. I believe Marvel comics movies are at a crossroads yeah. because are you going to go mature or are you going to go Ewoks? Yeah. You know, yeah. Here's two doors. And and I'm telling you, Logan yeah. and Deadpool showed the way. R-rated movies can make a lot, put, yeah. put asses in the seats. I like to talk about asses in the seats more than the money. Because yeah. if, if people are coming, then you've connected with them. And and I I think that, like, I think the, like the last really mature Civil War, not Civil War, Winter Soldier, and to some extent Civil War, operated on a more like espionage thriller mm -hmm. like like there was some spy craft and then we went to our big cosmic but somebody I, who i don't know if you ever worked with him he's an editor and, and and people who know me know i absolutely despise him he was as cruel as anyone could ever be yeah who's that he was, his name's mike carlin oh yeah yeah editor on hawk and dove and yes. but the, the one thing he said that was true to me in the late 80s he was talking about how they were canceling a book maybe it was checkmate maybe it was some other thing yeah. doom patrol and he said, no, by canceling this, we're pissing off 25,000, 30,000 readers 
who's who this is their favorite book. Hmm. He says, every time you end something, yeah, you cut the connection. Yeah. And you said it with Endgame. Yeah. I feel like my sons were like, okay, I saw I went on that 10 year ride. Yes. Which is a long time. And now there's a new journey ahead. And it's like there it's it's not all you can eat anymore. They're they're not hungry for everything. Yeah. So look, do, do I believe they'll find their way back? I always believe in people. I, I don't I don't believe in betting against anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, so I believe they'll find their way back. But you know, that that aspect of when we walked out of Endgame, there was an end. Like you said, Tony Stark is gone. Steve Rogers' story is over. Yeah. They made him old and retired. Like, yeah. I wonder if they would go back. I've always wondered and, and and said, maybe we shouldn't. If we're getting rid of Tony and Scarlett Johansson, we have two legit deaths here. Yeah. Maybe Chris Evans, maybe we convince him not to go 90 yeah. years old. Yeah. So, yeah. It's funny. I mean, I think it's even simpler than that, though. For me, it's about quality. And yeah. see, when you look at the first 10 years of comic book movies and people kind of discount those 2000s ones, but I mean, that's where the real brilliance was. That's where, you know, people were, were making this up as they were going along. Sam Raimi, you know, Christopher Nolan, all that stuff. Even Ang Lee, you know, somebody as brilliant as Ang Lee coming in doing a Hulk movie. We actually had really brilliant auteurs doing this stuff then. Brian Singer doing X-Men. You know, like everybody who was doing that stuff was an A-list director. But I think the next 10 years, you were starting to get into the kind of slightly more jobbing guys, you know, like the, these are guys who outside of Marvel were never going to cut it, you know, but Marvel kind of elevated them, you know. I and I think that that's the problem because it's hard to do this stuff well. You know, you need to be a Christopher are, Nolan or a Sam Raimi to, to pull this off. We are on the same page, Mark. And, and, and now I see some of these guys who were positioned by Marvel, and you and I know some of the inside. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you, your audience knows you have had Kick-Ass, you have had Wanted, you have all your Netflix shows. You are on the other side of this. You've experienced it, you know it. Yeah. Um, Marvel has a great ability to pre viz a lot of their more expensive stuff. Yeah. Um, there's a director Marvel worked with that I spoke alongside in yeah. 2016, 2017. No, it was 2017, between Deadpool movies. It was at a film symposium he had directed some small films he now has gone on to make a successful film for marvel yeah but in 27 we sat he did not have a penchant for superhero movies did not know superhero movies didn't yeah. direct anything close to action but mm -hmm. now he's been given the keys to the kingdom and they're relying on him for more and i'm like this guy's not even a comic book fan yeah. and all of the wow action stuff that you saw was yeah. pre vised he's never oh. directed anything action yeah they would it's that whole, you know, some of these guys, they just want you to direct the actors, which he does well. Yeah. But like you said, some of these guys are being elevated yeah. and and beyond their station, yeah. in my opinion. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. Because like you said, you know, I've talked about it. James Cameron looked at Alien and said, I can't remake that, yeah. but I can take it in a different direction. And yeah. I can make it this sci-fi action spectacle. And you're like, aliens is now an action movie it's not a horror movie you know and then fincher yeah. took it in a different direction maybe not as popular but but these auteurs right that's what keeps it going and, and look like you said i saw rocketeer four times that summer when it came out in 1994 yeah. 1990 and when they gave uh captain america to uh to johnson i yeah. i thought He's super talented. Yeah. And, and Captain America is one of the better films. It is one yeah. of their better, what is it called? First Avenger? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, he, 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 uh, I, I'm doing him a disservice. Uh, I, I'm going to get his full name here. Um, uh, gosh, he directed The Rocketeer. He, he, he helped create Boba Fett. Um, oh, it's, um, I don't know why I'm blanking as well, because I, I know, uh, him, and, and even I'm blanking. I was, I was on that set for Captain America. It's yeah. um, Joe Johnson. Joe Johnson. Joe Johnson. I said it. I just said Johnston. But yes, Joe Johnson's no, a great Joe, director. I love him. Rocketeer's great. And then again with uh with um oh my, can't, it can't happen again. Honey, uh, I shrunk the kids as well. That's um, Joe Johnson. Um, fourth. Yes, Honey, I shrunk the kids. I love even that. Really, yeah. His Jurassic Park three is underrated. It's I really think it's good. the best of the entire Jurassic Park franchise. I'm not kidding. I think Jurassic no, think Park three is the best. That's the scene on the Brit. He had the pterodactyls. The pterodactyl yeah. scene is. Inside the yes. bird cage when you pull back yes. and everything. Yes. And the little barmy he, guy and everything. Brilliant. He's the guy it. who had real accomplishments in um yeah. help me out. Who's the guy who directed Thor and he did Murder on the Nile and he did oh, uh, Kenneth Branagh? Kenneth Branagh. Kenneth Branagh. Another yeah. they were going to unconventional, yeah, but super yeah. talented guys. Yeah. You know, look, I'm happy. Black Adam seems to have gotten enough good optics that they yeah. can exit stage. 
Yeah. But that felt like a, man, that felt like a long birth. Like that was like a lot, like, man, they were in labor with that one for a long <laughs> time. And so, you know, um, I know now, you know, look, also Mark, people put too much stock in the comic books, yeah. in the comic book movies. I'm still a comic book fan. What's going yeah. on in the pages, right? Yes, yeah. Um, you know, but, but, and I, again, my son, when he was 17, wanted to tell me, you know, dad, I'm a MCU fan. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're just gonna have to live with that. I like the movies. <laughs> I'm not, I, 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 I wore the merch and I like the stuff. I know yeah. you're a comic book guy, but, but me and my friends, we celebrate them. I said, I know we, we take your birthday parties are all around Marvel yeah. releases. I mean, it's always, he's the first week of May and Marvel always had a first week of May movie. Yeah. And that became, take me to IMAX, take me, take me and my friends. So you know, I understand this next generation, but even he, like you said, my kids are now hungry for something a little more meat on the bones. So we will see where that goes. Uh, it'll it'll definitely be interesting to see where it all evolves. I remember five or 10 years ago, whenever they were doing maybe three or four superhero movies a year, people were like, this is too much. You know, like you say, that's eight hours a oh, year. Oh. This is too much. And now there's so many, I don't have time in the day to watch a fraction of them, you know, but- I I talk to the guys in the studio about this and I, I say to them all at different studios, there's not an infinite amount of talent. It's like no. comic books, you know, there's far too many comic books being published as well, you know? So like for the talent pool that's there and it's exactly the same with the TV shows, isn't it? You know, like, it's not like making baked beans. You can't just turn the machine a little faster that's and right. make more of these right. beans. You know, th there's only a certain number of brilliant people emerge to make these movies, isn't there? And I think we've overstretched. And and you uh, locked into that with you, you and Matthew Vaughn, mm -hmm. um, your, again, Kick-Ass was one of the first brilliant, R-rated, badass, connected, you know, no one had, no one knew what Kick-Ass was. It was the dawn of superhero movies, but you had great talent behind the camera. People flocked to that day. I mean, I cannot tell you, I mean, like, again, more mature material i think there's a whole generation that's never seen that movie that if they saw it they'd be like what is this and then yeah. the kingsman i remember the kingsman was coming out you know kingsman and deadpool were very beloved yeah. by fox yeah because they were made again they were made on strict budgets mm. which means you know what the thing is people have to work harder they have to improvise more yeah and uh and, and we've known this like when you are given less money more creative solutions have to be create you know th th that has to be you know, the path that you, that you travel. And I, I, again, with the, what you mentioned, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man, I talk about those movies all the time. Yeah. They, they are brilliant. The first and one, no, I mean, the first one's so underrated, isn't it? But it, I love that brilliant. movie. My kids watch that movie constantly, you know? But... It, it still, it still captures me. I mean, Raimi was, he, he really was ahead of his time. And again, yeah. like once they gave money to Brian Singer on X-Men 2, yeah. uh, whatever happened in his personal life aside, that X-Men 2 is a great, fun, kick-ass, great ride. Looks like James Cameron shot it. It's so slick and, and, and the performances are great. But yeah, no, I mean, like, so there you go. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm interested to see what comes after, like, what's in the pipeline next. Yeah. Because, I mean, I will give Marvel and DC a ben benefit of the doubt. A, a lot of what we're seeing is a byproduct of post or mid-COVID where yeah. they had to adjust some of the productions yeah. go back film later, you know, so we'll see. But like you said, er, there's comics are everywhere now. There, there's a movie all the time. I kind of like people trying something new as well. So it's always exciting, you know, like yeah. to go to Shang-Chi after the end game and everything. I kind of like the boldness of that. And I actually enjoyed Shang-Chi. I thought Shang-Chi was really good. But I was talking to some pals at Marvel and I said, look, what's going on? You know, why are, you know, you're in this, you've got this incredible territory you've staked out, you know, but now you seem to be pushing it to one side and trying all this new stuff. And they said, we're taking the beach. Then we take the town and then we take the capital, you know? And I was oh like, my gosh. you're good. You're going to lose the beach. <laughs> so like, yeah, you, know, no. you have to be it, careful it, as well. You know, that, that Marvel logo, again, like I said, with anything, you have to earn it. Mark, we, every time we sit down, you have to earn me. I'm not, yeah. I will never just give my, look, No Way Home could have been a completely cheesy weirdo yeah. movie. It worked. They yeah. brought three eras. They brought all those villains. And, and we were like, oh my God. I mean, I could not have seen it with a more jaded Hollywood audience at the premiere <laughs> and everyone was screaming, which is, as you, you well know, those uh, industry functions, people, yeah. they're not always receptive. Yeah. And boy, like again, Spider-Man was a high bar to clear bringing yeah. back Toby and Garfield. 
And to me, that was that's fresh. It was a year ago. It worked. It was brilliant. Yeah. Um, since then, like I said, what does it say about me that I haven't seen anything? Yeah. No, but I read comics and my kids see them. You know, what's more important. I'll call my son because he's yeah. again on his own 22 living in Texas with his buddies. And yeah. he's like, so what are you doing? He goes, I'm going to see Black Adam. I said, you call me with the review tomorrow. I want to <laughs> hear what you thought. What you thought is way more important than what I thought, you know, because so it's fun to live it through them at, at this at this point. Do you know, it's funny. I was going to, one of the questions I was going to ask you is we both get kids. Have you done yeah. what I've done and brainwashed the kids into being into all this stuff as well? Have you, have you, ah. have you, have you, have you, have you since the little kids kind of started to, you know, feed drip all this stuff to them or have you let um, them just go I, and watch Hannah Montana and all that kind of stuff? No, you know, my daughter really leads us, us because she has her own interests. Right. And, you know, it, it's fun watching what she's into, the music she's into. She's my youngest. She's 18, but uh, she's a freshman at college now. Uh, my middle son, yeah. uh, my second boy is, uh, he immediately bypassed all mainstream comic book superheroes and movies and lives yeah. and breathes anime and manga, anime, manga, anime, manga, anime, manga. Wow. That is that, that he, that is his thing. He's into the, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon. And, and that is completely like the domain that he exists in and here's the deal mark he is uh i can't really say much about it yeah but he is um filming a series for paramount right now no and way. it comes out in january and he already did a movie for disney and he just did another movie that, like a kind of a romantic comedy and at 20 years old like that's like, insane he's crushing it now the, yeah. the it was announced he's in a he's in a show called wolf pack uh -huh. which is on going to be on Paramount Plus. And um, we get to see sneak peeks all the time. He, sh he shares right. it. But I mean, he's making now genre material. And uh, I think, like, trust me, I'm going to be living in Chase Liefeld's world real, real soon. <laughs> you know, uh, he's not going to be living in mine. Yeah, Ch Chase, Chase Liefeld. Liefeld, he was only yeah. going to be a success with a name like Chase Liefeld. Like that's, that's like Max Power, isn't it? It's like one of those names. I love that. Well, Robert Rodriguez's take... kid's called Rocket Rodriguez. I think you've done the same thing for this. Oh, this I book. love it. I love it. Well, Chase, uh, here, here's the funny thing in the in the compliment is he's been gone for three months. Right. And and we get every day we get deliveries because he's getting that uh that TV actor um series money and he's sending all, all, we get we get Yu-Gi-Oh cards, Pokemon cards, <laughs> anime stuff at the door every day man he he is hitting amazon and i, I said chase, chase you, you have like a you have like a treasure trove waiting for you when you get home in a couple of weeks yeah. um because they're about to wrap but yeah no it's going to be interesting because uh like i said he's making genre wolf pack yeah. is a supernatural uh show and and uh, sarah michelle geller is in it and oh, uh, and and rodrigo santoro is the male lead it's it's, it's a great cast yeah. And so he's among, he's among really talented people. And so, yeah, it's going to be interesting because he, he, he has always marched to the sound of his own drum. And like I said, yeah. anime and manga, he'll be like, dad, 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 come on, come on, come on. You got to watch Chainsaw Man, dad, one punch man right now, dad. I don't want to hear about Akira. I don't want to hear about Gotcha Man. <laughs> That's your shit. Come watch My Hero Academia. And yeah. I'm sitting watching My Hero Academia going, My Hero Academia in America is in every mall, every yeah. kiosk. Yeah. It is this generation's x-men yes you know um the, the, the this is the those characters mean to them what wolverine and colossus and rogue meant to us so again i'm getting an education and you know in my work i have always leaned into manga my, yeah. my entire all the image guys were big yes. manga guys. yeah we yeah. were kind of the first guys to bridge that so it's it's fun to have my son teaching me because let's be honest manga is bigger than you know western comics um, oh my god yeah. So, yeah yeah i mean you go into barnes and noble you go into our bookstores here and yeah american comics are in the back and they're given one bookshelf and manga has seven bookshelves but i saw this coming about 16 17 years ago right and i, yeah. I had this real moment with my oldest daughter she was sitting drawing and she was drawing pokemon she was drawing dragon ball z and all these things yeah. and the style she was drawing in was a japanese style and i was like she loves this the way I love Super Friends, yeah. and I would draw in the style of Kurt Swan or Alex Toth or Jack Kirby. Or you know, her influences are going to be completely different. So the generation that comes after us, they're going to love 
you know Jap Japanese stuff you know like, Absolutely. You know, and, and you can't fake it you know you either grow no. up loving that stuff or you don't you know that's the way music and film and all these things you are the sum of everything you've taken in but I love it because culture can't stay in one place you know no. the idea of the kids being into super friends now is insane of course you know like it has <laughs> to move on another 40 years that's right. That's, that's right that's right but like you said I've always and look Mark you, you've you done the same I followed you the mashups um, mashing genres taking something from one and putting it to, I mean, it's what George Lucas did on Star Wars. I knew it yeah. at nine years old. I, I, I mean, I remember sitting there going, he looks like a prophet out of the Old Testament, Obi-Wan, and wait, he's a samurai. Darth Vader's in <laughs> black samurai armor. And yeah. okay, Jedi, that's a spiritual movement. Okay, oh, he's a cowboy. Han yeah. Solo's a cowboy. That's a saloon. Yeah. And I'm like, George just mashed it up. Yeah. And and in doing so, uncorked literally an, a, an empire that we're still swimming in. I mean, like you said, you can, the great thing I think about Star Wars, you can get on and off with great ease. You yeah. can leave it behind. And as they expand it and go to other worlds, it's easy to re-engage. Cause I'm like you, I don't, I can't, I can't follow all the Star Wars either, but yeah. there's less of it. Mark, you get, you get three Star Wars things a year now. Yeah. You get eight Marvel things a year. Yeah. Like there's, it's, it's, there hasn't been a Star Wars movie in theaters in, in four years. But do you no, not think it's Star Wars to me isn't a universe though? Star Wars to me is like the Godfather. And there was two big families in the 70s. There was the Corleones and there was the Skywalkers. And yeah. the minute you move it away from the Skywalkers, it's not Star Wars. It's just another, you know, generic. I challenge you. I challenge you. Watch Andor. Watch it. But it's brilliant. It I was bored in Rogue One though. Yeah, I mean, is it is, it, is boring? I, okay, one? okay. I love Rogue One. Uh, right. I, I love I loved Rogue One. So we don't have to like the same yeah. stuff. But um, I'll give it a try for you. I'll give it a try. I love the see the thing about Rogue One, Mark. How many years had we sat as kids and teens and 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 listened to them in Star Wars go? Many spies died getting us this information, and then one day they said, "We're gonna do a movie about the spies that died." And Mark, I was all in. I was like, I think Rogue One is one of the better. But we, knew they, but we knew they died. Like, I remember having this conversation with Matthew sure. Bond a few years back, right? We were talking about prequels and I said, I, I don't think there's ever been a good prequel. And okay. he said, why not? I said, because we know they die or whatever. You know, we know yes. what happens and all these things or we know they live. So Butch Cassidy, the early years, we know he lives. You know, there's no jeopardy. It's the same right. as Han Solo. Right. And I said to him, name one good sequel, a uh, good prequel ever. And he went silent and I said, tell me one. And he went, X-Men first class. You know, I forgot he'd done one, you know, so yeah. Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> and I right. said to him, the lowest gross next, man. Lowest gross next, man. You know, oh, so. <laughs> man. Listen, you, you and Vaughn, man, you're punching each other. You know, <laughs> look, prequels are tough. And I, I always felt that, that George Lucas distracted us. Yeah. By giving us General Grievous and Count Dooku and Darth Maul. Yeah. The, the great thing about the prequels is all the bad Sith Lords. Yeah. And, and some of the extra Jedi. So he built out the people who love that. Um, Darth Maul is awesome right. as well. I mean, the best design in the whole of Star Wars, I think, is Darth Maul. I love oh, that. Oh, me too. Amazing. I mean, amazing. So, 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 no, you're right. Straight up, prequels are hard, but he is right. X Men First Class was, uh, honestly, I feel like it saved X Men after. I mean, it, it literally, and it should not have worked. And you know, Mark, I think you and I talked at the time, and some of the Marvel guys, some of the Marvel guys that we know, yeah. they're like, huh, 60s <laughs> X Men. This can't work. <laughs> 1960s x-men there's no way and i'm like it's gonna work it's groovy. cool I mean, that again was cool. you get a great writer like jane goldman and you get a great director like matthew i mean this is the secret sauce it's the same as the comic books you know you put mark silvestri on batman and today everybody's talking about batman you know like it's all about the talent isn't it you know it is. how good how good was that book how okay good was, oh mark in 2017 we had a yeah. 25th anniversary image comics and he goes do you want to see these pages? Really? And he on his phone showed me the first three issues. And I was like, when can I have this? When can I have this? Yeah. And he's like, it's coming along. It's coming along. So now I think it's, uh, I think it's eight issues. Yeah. And Mark, uh, I knew when it hit that it would reinvigorate him. Yeah. Batman. Cause you know, segue into comics. I go to my store the other night. Great store. Haven't been there in a long time. One yeah. of the one of the stores I frequent. Um, it's a little further drive, but it's one of the best stores. And I was going in, and he had some uncanny X Men from Claremont and Byrne. And if I see them, I buy them. I don't care how many I have. I go. I want those. I need yeah. those. Even if I have X Men one thirty four and X Men one thirty five. And I said, Hey, I'll take these. 
And he goes, oh, Mr. Liefeld, thank you. You're saving the day for us. I go, what are you talking about? And he's like, oh, it's been a rough couple of days, customers. And I'm like, but this is new comic day. This DC books in, in the States, yeah. DC books come out on Tuesdays. Oh, so right. customers can go in on Tuesdays. Everything else is released on, you know, Wednesdays. But by Tuesday night, you pretty got it, much you got everything. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, oh, sales are soft. And, you know, and, and, and the truth of the matter is, and every retailer in Southern California will tell you that DC has been on a steep down downturn. Yeah, and I, I used to say it and people got mad at me. So I didn't say it. I, I stopped saying it. But 10 years ago, say, I said, it's Batman. It's not you. Any Batman is always going to be the emergency go-to. And Dio kept hitting that button more, 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 because he was trying to keep up with Marvel's market share. And yeah. that and it became a market share game. Yeah. And most people don't understand. It became a market share game, which is why you got 18 batman titles i think it was last year i don't read them often but 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 uh i saw rich johnston put up on bleeding cool 15 batman books in one day i said i can't believe this i gotta go one day one day one week oh one my week. god and so now when i go in they go oh well you know what this one kid is sweet he calls me mr life he goes you know mr life i mean there's the batman books are eating each other and then another retailer said rob People come to me and they go, which Batman book should I buy? And I'm like, I don't know. Cause they're like, well, which one matters? And he's like, I don't know. And he's, and, and I even, I, I got in the car with joy. Cause she's like, I- I'm just going to sit in the car. Okay. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, you know, so I, I said, I got all this stuff in there. Like, Thank you for buying all this stuff. I bought some omnibuses. And I was like, wow, the comic stores are, you know, the traffic is dying down U S we may be in a recession. Yeah. And, uh, but I said, joy, you know, and, and even I, I say the last great crossover book was Civil War. That's it. It's the one that mattered because the effects in Civil War were immediately affected. You felt it in the Marvel Universe. Peter Parker's unmasked. You know, um, the kids have died. Cap versus Iron Man is felt. I said, you have to feel it. And I was showing her in X-Men 108, John Byrne's very first issue of the X-Men. Yeah. The, the X-Men are battling the Shi'ar off planet. And there's a cosmic disturbance that's caused by the big giant, whatever. It's not the Kyber crystal because that's Star Wars, but it's, and Mark, you know, you love this one page as a kid. We're now in the Baxter building and Reed is registering the energy that's coming off through the galaxy. And then he's on, Jimmy Carter is on, is on the screen, the president of the United States at the time. And he's talking to Cap and Iron Man in the Avengers headquarters. Did you guys feel this? We felt this silver surfer is flying and goes, what did I just feel? And then Spider-Man, my, my sense is tingling. This one page showed me as a kid, what's happening. The X-Men is being felt by the entire Marvel universe that is lost on. I think at both publishers, more so Batman, more, more so DC. If you're going to do something, it has to be reflected in other comics for it to resonate and to matter. If you're going to do it, if you're going to make big events, it has to be carried. And what's happened is with 18 Batman books and Mark, there's 18 Batman books. I'm with my buddy. So now it's just like buy the Silvestri, buy the new cool hot. It's the best drawn one. Yeah. No one's drawn Batman. That's that good in 40 years. Period. Full stop. I think it's the best ever. I've never seen Batman. Okay. Yeah. It's like Neil Adams and Mark Silvestri. They're, 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 They're battling for dying. No, Mark is... He is the best illustrator in our business yeah. over the last 40 years. It's not even close. The comics are simple as well. Like, see if you have about three or four must-have books like that, then everybody comes back into the shops. You can oh. get them in for what you can get Dark Knight Returns will bring people and Watchmen. You know, you, you can have to have a couple of those things, right. maybe three or four if you have Batman year one. And then it becomes a habit again. It's a bit like when Avatar came out in cinemas and it got people going back into cinemas again. You know, they they hadn't been for a while, but they they, they come yes. in, they go and see Sherlock Holmes. And Sherlock Holmes does 600 million when they thought it was going to do 250, you know? And it's I, I think it's the same with comics. You know, we need a lot of these big event comics, but I'd love to see them trim back a little as well, just the lines in general. Like, I was reading some old stuff recently to my kids, and I couldn't believe how few books were published back when these things sold hundreds of thousands oh. of copies. Oh. And, and you could buy them all, you know? And I think I think there's some there's a power in that, isn't there? You know, That's under 20 saying. titles a month would be amazing, yeah. Because because I I go well, well what Batman book do you like and he goes oh uh, Dark Knights um, yeah I go what's Dark Knights he goes it's set in medieval times they're literally <laughs> Dark Knights and I'm like I don't want that 
like, <laughs> like, like, like I, that, that I, see Mark's Batman works. Cause it's, it's Batman. It's Gotham. It's Joker. Yeah. It's a mystery. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's like, it's like you're saying, and, and the one advantage yeah. that, that really, they didn't used to have it. Yeah. Because if you go back and I, the great thing I've done on my podcast, the thing I'm so excited by and, and people, you, I, I never knew I took for granted the access to this information, but because I kept all my comics journals and all my amazing heroes way before wizard, the, yeah. the, 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 the magazines that worked a little harder, they yeah. had, to, they charted and, and, and Mark, you and I grew up in a, in, in the time where there was five Superman books. Mm. It was world's finest Superman action. The Superman family, DC yeah. comics presents. Yeah. Okay. Superman was so popular. Yeah. He had his own wing. Okay. Yeah. They didn't have to always re reboot and, and, and see if, uh, if they could try and make Superman interesting. People love Superman. He was an icon. Yeah. That's why the movie got made in the first place. But then of course, Batman had world's finest brave and the bold detective Batman, um uh uh and justice uh, league as well yeah. batman family and they were all in justice league mm -hmm. and you go then there was the justice league family of titles then george and marv made the titans a big thing and that got yeah. spinoffs and i tell people i didn't even want to talk about the legion of superheroes for so long because i go no one will know what i'm talking about because this generation does not have the same respect because those characters just don't exist for them yeah. but i'm like at one point the legion carried four monthly books four what? two legion books then a spinoff book with with uh, with uh, the Legionnaires three with with the original with uh, with Lightning Lad, Cosmic Boy, Saturn Girl. Then they had a seven month Who's Who in the Legion. When Who's Who was big, Legion got their own Who's Who. Like was that got, was that like late eighties, eighty eight? Yes. Like because like, like that was a great series. I remember Ernie Colon drew that, didn't he? I think it was a yes. really beautiful looking series. Karen Berger weirdly was the editor on that, which you wouldn't yes. assume would be Karen. But I used to follow Karen. As an editor, the way I would follow us at one point, because yeah. Karen was always a sign of quality on a book, wasn't she? That was, she was. That was a great little she run. Was. You know? Yeah. But DC doesn't have those families anymore. Whereas yeah. Marvel, Marvel goes, What am I going to hit you with? You want to, well, I think we're going to focus on the Spider Man family this month. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. Next next month, it's the 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 X Men family. Yeah. And again, within the Spider Man family now, you have yeah. the Venom family, Venom, Carnage. The symbiotes, okay? Then yeah. in the X family, you got Deadpool. You've got spinoffs. Then, okay, well, there's the Avengers family. Yeah. We have the Avengers family. And then, I don't know, what do we call this? You know, Ghost Rider and Punisher and the Vigilantes. I mean, Marvel. Oh, and then and then now they go, yeah. well, we'll hit you with the Star Wars family. Yeah. We're doing Star Wars because we own that again. We, we published that. Mm -hmm. And Mar Marvel has families of books they can throw at you, yeah. each with tremendous growth in a fan base. Yeah. And what Didio did, and Jim didn't do much to change. And I don't mind naming names because it's these are the guys that controls. They just stayed in that damn Batman zone. Briefly, yeah. Jeff Johns, great talent, said, I love Green Lantern. Yes. I'm going to make him he, kick ass. He did a great job of that. Yeah. Yeah. Ivan Rice, remember, good talent. Yeah. Really. And 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 suddenly Green Lantern, that to be honest, that's when my son was my oldest. From about 2007, I, he'd go to the shows with me. Yeah, He'd go to the conventions and he'd say, Dad, I really like Green Lantern. Great, let's go buy Green Lantern. And then he started saving up his money. Yeah. And we'd go to the bookstore and he'd buy trade paperbacks. And it was all that Jeff John yeah. stuff. Yeah. And Darkest Night, Blackest Night. And then he went and saw the movie. The movie killed I, it for people. That, yeah. He thought it was silly. And so after two and a half years, he went, I, I, I just, I don't know, Dad. I, I was expecting... The, the movie to be more serious mm. and uh at that point he kind of gave it up but there was green lantern had his imagination and so yeah. sometimes the movie the kid is going in expecting this incredible engagement and if he doesn't yeah. get it then it's not as cool yeah. so you know um well I it's mean, like a big extraordinary gentleman isn't it that that movie you know sort of sunk that book i mean that was the coolest book and yeah. I, I I was with that book right till the end. It's brilliant. But the public perception of that franchise then suddenly becomes a sucky movie instead That's of it. a terrific instead of a terrific comic book. And Green Lantern was the same. Jeff and Ethan and uh, Ivan and all those guys laid such amazing groundwork and all blown away in two hours. I'm yes, sorry, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it it's true. It's it's the one instance where a movie's bad reception i visibly saw in my own kid he was yeah. sad mark yeah. walking yeah. to the car he's nine years old it's 2000 yeah. no he's 10 it's yeah. 2010 he's 10 yeah he was 
like uh it's how i I'll, I'll be honest mark i know people defend this movie and i don't know why i want to slap everybody uh whatever he he was he was he was a great choice to be superman but the brandon ralph superman movie yes yeah. is god awful it's, so, you, it's, I, it's boring it's really it's, boring. well yeah. it, it, it the whole time so my wife and i went to like the thursday night preview yeah we went and had dinner at the beach and she understood we're going to come back. Rob loves Superman. He's been waiting yeah. for this. He's so excited. All the imagery was great. And then I couldn't believe when the movie was over that that was it. And Mark, I walked out, I walked out into the theater, like punch in the sky. And I said, I can't believe it for two hours. <laughs> and, and, and what he did was he lifted a rock. Oh, 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 can I possibly lift this rock? <laughs> He landed a plane and he lifted a rock. I said to my wife, I go, did you see him punch anyone? Did you see him strike anyone the whole movie? He never even, there was a guy who shot him in the chest, right? And he walked towards the bullets and knocks the gun out. But like, you want to talk about the most boring? Yeah. And, and I was like, it's been so many years since we had Superman. And like you said, there was talent in that movie. Kevin Spacey, yeah. before his problems, one of the most respected guys. You had obviously Brandon Routh was perfectly cast. He looked great. What a trailer misfire. was amazing. Trailer what was a so misfire. Great. Yes. Yeah. Huge yeah. misfire. Yeah. Huge. And it 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 dampened my spirits. It did. Well, I Superman's my favorite thing ever, right? So you can imagine I bought 25 tickets for that movie, took all of my brothers and you know, wives and everybody. And we had a huge family. And I I couldn't wait for me. It was the second coming. And I remember the trailer started with this line, you've been gone a long time. And I was like, Yes, I've waited forever for this, you know. And we couldn't wait. And we all came out of it and we couldn't even talk. We also I just walked out into the car park and we were like, Oh my god, you know. It's Superman wonderful. was a deadbeat dad at the end of the movie, wasn't he? He was oh, a deadbeat dad. Kind of a stalker. Yeah. And <laughs> what are you doing here and it was like a spiritual sequel i mean look you, you, your audience is like what are they talking about but the bottom line is you i have felt it that mit, when the things misfire yeah it really can uh it, it can damage the brand for sure Do you know i've got to ask you this like because i know you love marvel you love dc everybody has a thing at the at the beginning when they first get into comics that's their favorite thing like the marvel guys and the dc guys it's like football teams isn't it yeah. Were you a Marvel guy or a DC guy growing up? Like, what was the thing that was your first? Life? I would. I, I'm. I was 51 percent Marvel, 49 DC. Nowadays, I, yeah. I I'd say I'm 70 percent Marvel, 30 because what was the diet that I was feasting on? Even even when I was a kid, yeah. Before all that great Legion stuff, Mike Grell was doing Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes, and it was a great looking book, and those characters were great. Yeah. Yeah. Dick Dillon was doing the Justice League, and like I said, you had Garcia Lopez on Superman. And Jim Aparo on Batman, and oh, that's great. I mean, and and they and they have those giant Treasury editions. I, I tell everybody, look, my favorite comic book of all time, yeah, standalone is is Superman Muhammad Ali. It oh, should not amazing. work. Yeah. So good. And and I have some. You have a kid that's twice as big, isn't it? It's twice. As oh, big. but amazing. Superman and and Neil Adams told me once. He goes, you know, Rob. Yeah. That's the only interior Superman story I ever did. I never did another story between the covers. I only did Superman covers. And you're like, what? Really? That's why I. Mark, he never did a Superman story. He did, World, he did World's Finest and he did like Clark Kent backup strips and things, but you're right. He never actually did a Superman story. He said, story. I never did a Superman story. That is it. Wow. And you're like, you know, he did Batman. He did yeah. Green Lantern. But we think he had this great Superman run when all he was doing was all these great covers. But, um, but Do you no, know who was the first choice for that book, by the way? This, is, this oh. will blow your mind. You know who no. the artist was who was drawing it originally? I, I'm going to let you say it because I know. Kurt Schaffenberger. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that not? It was Muhammad Ali's people looked at Kurt Schaffenberger and looked at Neil Adams and said, "Yeah, we kind of like this more traditional Superman look." You know, no, how, sure. how different would that book have been? That'd have been crazy. No, and and uh, no, the, the great thing about Neil, because because I I on the circuit, uh, from about 2014 to 2018, yeah. we were doing a lot of shows together, and I said, "I'm just going to go sit down and and talk to him." Yeah, and he would. That's when I learned how much he redrew of Superman, Spider Man, and he said, "Rob." I love Ross Andrew. Oh, there's a reason that that you love that Superman in Superman Spider Man, and 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 he says the the Ross Andrews pages came in, and he would sit with Dick Giordano and say, "Dick, uh, we can't." He goes, "Ross is great, amazing storyteller, but this is an event. Yeah. This is Marvel and DC, and and he said, "Look, I I want to I want to enhance these." 
Yeah. And, and uh, Dick said, I, I won't stand in your way, Neil, um, but just, just be gentle. And Mark, there are obvious now at Heritage Auctions, when the pages yeah. go up, they say Ross Andrew, Dick Giordano, Neil Adams. It, it was like a really well, they didn't credit him. Yeah. And John Romita Sr., now that you know this, go look at half the Peter Parker faces. Mm-hmm. John Romita Sr. redrew those and, and drew over those. So this entire book, it's Ross Andrew, Dick Giordano, Neil Adams, Romita Sr. And uh, but there, there's giant shots of 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 those big double page spreads of Spider-Man and Superman and Spider-Man punching Neil. Neil goes, Rob, I just took the needed eraser and I erased everything that Ross Andrew did and I just drew over it. Can you and imagine I, that happening now? My God. You know? No. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, Mark, spend your afternoon sometime soon pouring over that book. I'm going to take this out. Huh? It is gorgeous. When you realize. It's a and great it's, book. And, what Neil said, and when Neil leaned into me, I mean, Mark, you got serious. This is 2014. Because I, I asked him about it. He goes, how'd you hear? I go, it's just something I hear on the circle. Well, let me tell you. Well, let me tell you. And then he leaned in and he goes, Rob, it's Superman, Spider-Man. It had to be done. We, it had to look the best. It had to look the best. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I had Dick's blessing. And so, and, and the whole thing is, if you look into the, the, the uh, I think comics, some uh, one publication from Tomorrow's, I forget what it is, but they uh, detailed they had Dick talking about it, Ross Andrew, but Mike Esposito, because because back then they divvied up Marvel writer, DC art, no D- DC writer, Marvel artist. Then it had to be a DC anchor, yeah. and Ross Andrew was mad that Mike Esposito wasn't his anchor because he felt like they worked best together. But it was right. like no, Dick Giordano is inking this, yes. which opened the door to Continuity Studios, which opened the door to Neil. So I, you know, that's the kind of stuff. So i i have me I have Muhammad Ali Superman original artwork. I, they're yeah. my favorite pages. Yeah, but um. You know, the point is, DC no longer offers me a great Legion book, a Titans book. Um, I, I don't even have a good Superman book that I love. Yeah. Uh, I see that they pour all of their resources into doing Batman. And that's going to break at some point. It's going to break. I, well, yeah, I think it already did. Between you, me, and the lamppost, my opinion, yeah. my yeah. opinion is it's already broken. Mm-hmm. And they need to get in there. Look, I, I got to be honest. They need, you know, and then Dio, I think he did like three or four crisis comics yeah he watered down the brilliance of crisis on infinite earth because he wanted to cash in on that title and i was told mm-hmm. by people at you see oh no dan thinks that that crisis title it ha- has some ha- has some appeal so yeah. he keeps in christ final crisis the real final crisis the final 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 crisis and it watered it down yeah. and they need an event to restore marvel does not yeah. marvel you understand marvel people they they have they don't need a reboot mm-hmm. I, I really do feel like dc needs some villain to come in and go like what what they did 40 years ago i'm wiping you all out yeah and here's a clean slate you know that, that could be the recession that could be the recession that does that you know so we'll, we'll see you that, know? That, but, that's my humble opinion yeah. so as you're throwing eggs at me on this screen <laughs> whoever you are dc fans i love here's a d- difference i love dc yeah. I love DC comics. I have DC original artwork. Yeah. I just told you my favorite pages that I own have Superman on them. Yeah. So uh, I would love to see them restored, but I just, there is a lack of vision and maybe yeah. it's because they keep getting sold every two and a half years and they just can't, you know. They, they seem to almost be as if everybody's about to be fired next week, don't they? It seems to be in panic mode all the time. There's no long-term strategies and everything. Yeah. And when you look back, I mean, for me, the golden age of DC, I'm curious what yours is. It's probably mid eighties. Of course, mid eighties is, yes. is perfect. Yes. That's it? it. The Jeanette Can sort of era really was just perfection, wasn't it? I mean, that's as good as I think it's as good as comic books go. I've always been a DC guy, so I even prefer it to Marvel. But what about you? What's your Marvel Golden Age or DC Golden Age? What do you think? So my Marvel Golden Age is not your Marvel Golden Age. Yeah, it is nineteen seventy seven to nineteen eighty three. That okay? And 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 here's the deal. And 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 I understand you're an accomplished, badass, amazing writer. But Jim Shooter and I've talked. I I I, I can do a hundred podcasts on Jim yeah. Shooter. Frank Miller was nineteen years old. He had only done a yeah. few issues of Daredevil with Roger McKenzie. Yeah, Jim Shooter has the foresight to say, "You can do the whole thing." The book was bi monthly. Daredevil yeah. was bi monthly on the cusp of cancellation. Yeah, Frank Miller comes in, writes and draws, introduces the the Yakuza, uh, Stick, Electra, 
he re he reshapes Kingpin into one of the most terrifying villains. And guys like you and me remember Kingpin was kind of a joke. He, he was, was like a guy. D-list, he was a D-list Spider-Man yeah. villain. Yeah. Now he's an A-list terrifying villain in the pages of Deadpool. Yeah. He then he he has to be King Solomon, yeah. Chris Claremont and John Byrne, and split the baby mm-hmm. and say, John, you get the Fantastic Four. Chris, you get to keep the X-Men. And it worked out. John yeah. goes on a five and a half year tour, remakes the greatest run since Kirby on Fantastic yeah. Four. Great stuff. Then Walt Simonson comes in. Thor was a joke for three years. Fill yeah. in after fill in, no creative team. Just like just like inventory story after inventory story. And then he's like, hey, I want to do Thor. What are you going to do with him? He's going to lose his hammer in the first issue. And we're going to give it to a horse-faced alien. And kids like me were like, wait, no. That first, that last page of Walt's first Thor when Don Blake is on top of the sh- helicarrier and he, and it's rain is pelting down on him. And he's like, father, like save me. And so you yeah. thought as a reader, well, his dad will get this right next time. And what happens in the second issue, Odin summons Thor, summons Beta Ray Bill and says, we have an impasse here. So we're going to settle this by uh, trial by fire. You guys fight over it. So as a fan, you're like, Thor will get the hammer. Wait, what? What? <laughs> Thor didn't get the hammer? Like, And now he's going back to earth without Don Blake, without the other personality. And now he, he's in a ponytail and a t-shirt and he goes to Nick Fury and he goes, you know, I could help you out. I'm not really the God of Thunder anymore, but, and you're like, Walt Simonson, Frank Miller, Jim Starlin, John Byrne, freaking Jim Shooter unlocked all of them. Yeah. And that, that okay, the Avengers stopped in issue 202 when George Perez leaves. My generation, George Perez comes on the Avengers in 1975. Mm-hmm. And up until 1980, it's really George Perez, John Byrne. They both do long arcs. Yeah. So it's always two top talent, two yeah. legends. X-Men's got, goes John Byrne, goes Cockrum Byrne, Cockrum Paul Smith. Wow! Um, Like, blows my mind. The best art in comics. But then the royalties kicked in. Yeah. And everybody wanted to do the X-Men because it paid better. And yeah. you can tell... Nobody wanted to draw the Avengers anymore. The sales weren't there. The lineups were terrible. It yeah. lost my interest. Uh, and, and by this time, right around 82, 83, what's getting better? Frank Miller crosses the street. John Byrne is crossing the street. Mm-hmm. Perez crossed the street. DC's getting the, what do we said this whole time? The yeah. talent. The yeah. talent shifts, which then creates the golden age that we both, that there is a there is a producer. I don't know if you've ever met him. He's a funny kid. He's younger than both of us. His name's Adi Shankar. No, and he, uh, he does uh, Castlevania for Netflix. Oh. Um, he's done a bunch of animation and a bunch of uh, live action movie. He produced the Judge Dredd movie with uh, that everybody loves with um, mm-hmm. McCoy. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. He sits 10 years ago at a dinner in yeah. San Diego and he yeah. leans over to me, Mark. And at the time, I'm like, I don't want to believe this, but I know he's telling me the truth. He's probably 10, 15 years younger than me. Yeah. Addy goes, you want to know what's wrong with DC, Rob? I go, what? He's like... They peaked in 1986. They peaked. They, <laughs> they can't get beyond. And, and those fans just want to go back in time to 1986. They want to go back to Dark Knight and Watchmen and Man of Steel. That's when it all came together. Crisis ended. Yeah. Dark Knight happened. Watchmen happened. Swamp Thing was the best it ever was. He said, and they just live. The fans want 1986 back. That's their favorite time. Marvel has multiple times, but 1986 is this bright shining star that nobody can escape from. But and I think I'm it like, is DC's peak, but there can always be a second peak. There can always I, be a Mark, third. Because Mar- Marvel we're waiting. Three or four peaks at Marvel, you know. Well, you know who's not saving them? You and me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that we're, we're not the guys. So <laughs> I'm eager to see who figures it out. I'm eager to see because I want great DC comics and I currently. You know, even if there's two great DC comics, yeah. I, I used to get a lot more. Camelot 3000. I mean, they were innovators. Yeah. Innovators. It's Killing funny. I, I hadn't actually put it in perspective with that because the distribution in the UK and Scotland, for me, I wasn't getting that brilliant Marvel period. I was only getting the DC stuff in. So I only saw DC. And I, I saw the Marvel stuff separately as an adult later when I went back and picked that stuff up. But that's yeah. really interesting. I hadn't actually thought that what made DC hot in the mid eighties was really the migration of the Marvel talent. Wasn't they it? all left. Eventually. Think, you know, I've got this theory. Jim Jim Shooter, I think, changed the course of history. I think in a lot of 100%. ways. Right? I mean, I, I think Jim Shooter is a really pivotal figure, and I want to get him on in a couple of weeks. I'm going to try and get get Jim yeah. on. He's but a genius. 
Uh, he really, but here's here's the thing I noticed. Right? I'm obsessed with cycles of history, right? Yeah. And if you look at like that period, I talked to Jerry Cogman about this last week. 1938 to 1943, the entire DC universe is created inside five years. Yes. And then everything kind of runs on a 15 year kind of like, okay, well, we made this cool stuff and now let's exploit it. You know, Marvel was all created within about five years. The DC Silver Age within about three to five years. And then, you know, the more modern stuff, you know, like you guys, uh, Image, you know, that kind of began about 88 to about 93, all the things like Hellboy, the Image books, uh, Sin City and everything, you know. And then guys like me and Kirkman and everybody sort of like, late noughties into like to about 2012 yeah. saga was probably the last of the really big creator owned books of that period so there's I always agree. there's always a kind of five-year window where new material is needed except when jim shooter came in right so the time it was going to be i think was 1978 to 1983 that was the five-year window if you follow the 20-year cycle yeah. and jim came in and made marvel so cool that people didn't notice what they should have right. noticed which is shaken's american flag dread star all these books that should have been the big new creator own books, yes. you know? And Jim was doing such a good job in Marvel, we were all looking this way, you know? And and I think it knocked everything out by 10 years because he altered the course of this. Well, and, and ju look, just just when, like I said, really everyone's leaving, it's mm -hmm. just Walt Simonson. He's, he's about to stop writing and drawing Thor. Yeah. Secret Wars happens, a toy tie-in book that yeah. becomes the best-selling book. And now it, everybody you've interviewed, even the people who are loyal to Jim, will mm -hmm. say that changed Jim Shooter. Mm -hmm. He then had the biggest su success in the history of comics. He, um, cause I, I used to look, I hung out with Mike Zek early. He was one of the guys, he and Jerry Ordway took an early, uh, like they were fond of seeing me at San Diego comic-con. They take me to the parties, go to dinner with them. Yeah. I'm a teenager, but they're, yeah. they're teaching me the ropes. Everybody's got somebody teaching them the ropes. That's correct. And Mike Zek said, I had to draw six panel grids. Jim made a requirement and he wanted the camera pulled back at all times right. to see as many characters in the frame. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't want close-ups. He didn't want all the stuff I love to do. He yeah. said, you know, I hated it, but it really ended up being a huge financial windfall yeah. for me. Yeah. And, and so secret wars was this giant, you know, uh, book. And the other thing we're leaving out, Jim wrote like the best Avengers, Korvac, Ultron, Bride of Ultron, Jocasta, he yeah. had Count Nefaria, yeah. Andy's Legion, Andy's Superman. I mean, yeah. all the stuff he was doing. He's was a great writer. Yeah. And yeah. then he became a great manager. And I've read his blogs and how, and, and what also happened under Jim, mm -hmm. a licensing bonanza, GI Joe, Transformers. Yeah. He green, uh, Rom, Micronauts. Yeah. He brought them all in after Stan didn't want to do Star Wars. Roy Thomas yeah. will tell you he had yeah. to convince Stan, no, Stan, just let me do this. Stan's like, I don't want it. It looks bad. <laughs> and Roy's like, let me. Let me do this. And it yeah. saved Marvel. It gave them millions of dollars. It, it separated them from the fact they were probably not going to be the same company. But so Shooter then has this great management, finally gets overthrown because he maybe gets too big for his britches in 1987. And yeah. he's replaced. And But they, they really just stuck to all the things that he set in motion. Yeah. And under his watch, like I said, the Claremont... Burn divorce was one of the biggest in the history of comics. Fans like me, we felt it. Mm -hmm. But then I'm like, wait, John's going to give me Fantastic Four and Captain America and Alpha Flight. Okay, okay, I'm distracted. And Claremont just said, now I control the kingdom. And he made X Men bigger than anyone ever thought possible. Because yeah. the thing I remember Claremont said, do you know that it was right after John left, but because of John, mm -hmm. that every issue after outsold every issue after it, that started when john left in 1980 yeah and the royalties kicked in every issue of x-men started outselling every other issue it, every issue topped the next and it started on a giant you know but you're right it, it did change the cycles and again american flag uh i did a dedicated podcast just on howard and how it remade not just him but it affected the industry oh my god american flag is one of the greatest books ever made isn't it? brilliant it's absolutely amazing it's, yeah. It, yeah. and like i, I said howard. I said, look, no one's ever going to say this. And if I get in trouble, but Dark Knight doesn't happen without American flag. No, Frank, no, no. even suddenly, the, the panel. Yes, yes, everything. Yeah, yes. Yeah, you yeah. changed everything. Yeah. Frank's like, I have the new blueprint, everyone. I have it. Thank you, Howard. Um, Do you not think Chaykin doesn't, I don't think Chaykin appreciates himself. I don't think Howard realizes what a big deal he is to us. You know, guys yeah. at our age, you know, who, who yeah. 
for for us, comics was like you know kids stuff, and then you stumble on Howard Chaykin, and it's a whole not yeah. other level. And the places he goes as well, you know, the genres he dips into and everything, all his influences are from outside comics. He's he's a genius, an absolute genius. You were, you were probably just like me, Mark, in that because I I remember going, what what is it with American flag? And I go, yeah. well, it's got high heels, it's got garter belts, it has yeah. sex. Yeah. It hit. So in this interview with Howard. He said, I was going to give people what they couldn't get anywhere else. You didn't get <laughs> Hal Jordan laying down in bed with his woman, or you didn't yeah. get, you know, Clark Kent laying down with Clark, I mean, with, with Lois. And I mean, he gave us sex. He gave us a uh, mature themes, more violence, cursing, um, dealt with a lot of crazy sci-fi concepts. I mean, it was the right book for our age. Cause it, Whoa, that was puberty for mind. me. Like puberty kicks in with yes. American flag for me. So it was yes. perfect timing. And it's funny, I felt Howard, of all the creators, all the pros, he was the guy who looked like he was getting late. Like he seemed like yeah, a guy who was living oh, that life. That he was living guy. in LA, you know, just living and, that life. Yeah. And it's, and and I think so much of Howard, uh, so much of American Flag and everything that followed, his shadow, his Black Hawks, yeah. he was just oh, in America. How good is his shadow? Himself. Yeah. His shadow is amazing. He was just drawing himself. He was yeah. his own life model. So, yes. no, he, I, I really feel like, you know, between guys like you and guys like me, and yeah. me de devoting two hours to him on a podcast, people are sending me, Rob, I, I, I didn't know these exist. I ordered these. I ordered these. I ordered these. I got yeah. this trade paperback. I got this, you know, because uh, Barucci, Nikki put together a, uh, I think the first 16 issues in a nice hardcover about a decade ago. Oh, but, great. Again, so, so I'm like, people, go get these. Go, because Mark, I think everyone does feel like the comics from yesteryear are certainly, um, some of, are, are certainly better than what's coming out now. And look, here's the deal. There's a lot of good people making comics. And I want you to know that Rob Liefeld, Mark Miller, we we support all creatives. But what's happening at DC is a lack of vision. And what Marvel had was a vision. Even enough to go, I'm, you know, Marvel did super, DC had superpowers at the same time Marvel had Secret Wars. DC did not approach their toy tie-in yeah. with the same ruthless, yes. like, Jim Shooter said, I'm going to make something of this. I'm going to make this work. We're going to get toy money. We're going to get a toy tie-in. I mean, that's management style. Yeah. And Secret Wars became the biggest thing ever. But his ability to go, hey, young Frank Miller, yeah, we'll fire everybody, do whatever you want. Oh, yeah. it's a monthly book now? Daredevil? Oh, it's our number one. Frank Miller took Daredevil to number one. It jumped X-Men. George yeah. Perez talks about it. He's like, here I was duking it out with, with X-Men over here, the Titans. And the next thing I knew is I'm not fighting them anymore. Frank Miller's sitting on top of the castle. Yeah. With the devil. Uh, I mean, that's what's so inspirational, isn't it? You can take any book and make it number it. one. Any book. That's it. You did it with New Mutants. You know, New Mutants was was the bottom. That's my inspiration. Of the pile. But that uh, that was the bottom of the pile for the X Men before you took it over, wasn't it? It was like kind of. I think it was. Hey the Rob, do whatever you want. We're gonna cancel it if it doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. They're like Rob. <laughs> here's your fixer upper. It yeah. was a shanty house. I mean, I was showing my buddy the other day because because there's issues. In one of the last crossovers, yeah, that they did like Follow the Mutants or Inferno. I got the omnibus, yeah. And look, there was a character named Birdbrink. You know what? I, I'm gonna show you. I'm not gonna <laughs> you. I, can't, I can't resist. Mark, Mark, how hard is it? Let's. I want your audience to know how hard was it for me to succeed when this is what I was chasing. Mark, <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm just gonna show you. I'm just gonna show you, people of Earth. This is what I had to compete with. Um, uh, and my buddy's like, is that real? I'm like, it's real. This is a real <laughs> character. Y you know, you're like, Rob, I put bird brain out of my mind. Everybody put bird brain out of their mind. That's bird amazing. brain. Yes. Bird brain was a character that was getting hover treatment. Bird brain. I mean, uh, you keep talking. I'm going to get these great visuals. Do you know what uh, I was actually going to say to you as well, prior to this, let's see. Bird brain was a member of the New Mutants, and they wondered why the sales were in the toilet. <laughs> I mean, bird brain. Hey, everybody, you know, this is what I always say. Like, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta test that name out. Oh, oh, Mark, better. They put him on a cover. He became a member. Bird you know brain. What? Hey, bird That looks brain. quite cool. I think that looks all right. <laughs> oh, you're nuts. I know you're trying to get people, Matt. This is not what kids want. This I'm starting to reevaluate. This is not what people who want the X-Men want. And and Bird Brain became a member. You know what? I had to draw him on a pinup on my first New Mutants. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I'm going to try and do the best damn Bird Brain. But maybe 
maybe this needs, uh, you know, I'm like, maybe this needs a guy like Cable. Maybe this needs a whole new villain. Maybe this yeah. needs a new, you know, fixer uppers are fun, yeah. you know? And, uh, and, and so, yeah, the new mutants uh, opened a doorway for me, uh, you know, to, to, to show off because sometimes it's fun to say none of this is working and look, Mark, they let me clear, you know, buy bird brain, buy everybody. Yo, I'm going to only keep Sam and, yeah. and boom, boom. And we're going to, here's cable and domino and, and Shatterstar and dead Deadpool. And it changed the course. It, cha it changed the book around. Do you know no. if Disney Plus sees this, you know that Bird Brain's going to get a ten-part series, don't you? You know, it's like, you know that's going to happen. Let's keep this quiet. Let's keep. This They're quiet. like Bird Brain is. It's that would be great. 30, 40 years later, Bird Brain finally gets his due. Mark, he was a member of the team. He that's squealed. Amazing. He went squaw, squaw. I mean, it. He was a bird. But tell um, me, this speaking of birds, Hawk and Dove. Like I, yeah. that's when I first discovered you. Actually, I discovered you before. Uh, okay. new since when because I was a DC guy, you know, so I was reading yeah. this stuff, and I'd never seen anything like you before. Like, I I, I hadn't seen any of the other image guys. I think at that point, I, I'm just gonna oh exit. I'm just gonna exit this. This is like therapy for you. Here. Yeah. <laughs> now listen, Hawk and Dove, Hawk and Dove. So like, Kinsel. so tell me, when when did you make that jump? You know, into DC. Like, what what was the catalyst that got you in there? What so was I'm the, so happy you asked. This. I've I've told this before. So Barbara and Carl Kiesel were yeah. married at the time. Yep. And they had an outline that they had with them at San Diego in 1987. I yeah. had just been hired and I was looking, I, they were giving me short stories. And I literally sat down in a chair behind the DC booth, which was just a couple tables. Yeah. And I read this two page outline. Yeah. You know, I had always liked Hawk and Dove. I liked Hawk yeah. better, but I thought the weak link was the brother Dove. And, yeah. it's, you can, and look, Gil Kane and Steve Ditko both failed. With this character i mean super talent tried to make this happen in the late yeah. 60s early 70s and then every time they showed up i mean so there's a reason they killed dove in crisis yeah i, I think there's there's only so much mileage you get out of a character that says stop don't hit that guy i'm for peace i represent <laughs> peace well they had this concept that they would not be war and peace they would be chaos yeah. and order and so we sat down we talked they had this new villain named kestrel that, yeah. that was really a sadistic, like uh, based on the hitch, the hitchhiker with Rutger Hauer, that mm -hmm. movie, like, and yet he could manifest and become a supernatural being. And so they let me, uh, well, first of all, Mike Carlin said, you're not qualified for this. You're, you're not qualified for this. You're, you're just breaking into the business and we're looking for bigger names. Well, I am very open in that I waited for six months for every possible name in comics to turn it down. <laughs> nope, nope. Even some of my friends, even some of my friends, yeah. I said, Hey, we, did, did you get offered Hawk and Dove? And they said, they said, uh, yeah, I'm not going to do it. I go, when are you going to tell DC? I'm, I'm telling them this afternoon. So I'd be like, that's five guys that have told you no. Okay. There's one more guy. They go to one more guy. I even joked with Carl a couple of months, a couple of years ago. I go, remember when I had to sit around? I mean, literally Mark. Yeah. I was, it's like when you're picking for sports Yeah. And you're the last, last guy I, I'm the last guy picked, but I'm like, okay. And then, like, me and Carlin battled because he wanted the female dove to have a skull cap. Like, just like the dove. Basically, the male dove except with breasts. Mm -hmm. And I fought for just the hair. I wanted to give her yeah. this long, flowing hair with the shawl. Resistance, resistance, resistance. Finally, it's in the back of the trade paperback. Yeah. Carl Kiesel says Rob was right. He went to bat on all these changes mm -hmm. and came out, and we got the Dawn Granger we needed. And I think the dynamic worked. And it was only a couple of years ago I realized when I was fighting with DC to give me my um, portion of Dove, which I got, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, I said, Don Granger doesn't exist without me. And this is what I did. And it's historical. It's written here, blah, blah, blah. People like that male-female dynamic. They were a great duo. Yeah. And, then, you know, I mean, they, they, they had their own comic series for the first time in years, but Don Granger... And Hank Hall as Hawk and Dove have been together 10 years more than mm -hmm. the original Hawk and Dove. So we really created something that uh, that chemistry works. Sure. And, and so then by issue three, Marvel was calling me. You want to do the yeah. X-Men? You want to come? I'm like, what? The X-Men? That's, that's a hell of a promotion, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's incredible. Mark, yeah. Especially in 1988. Again, yeah. 
because Mark Silvestri has got the silver Porsche. He's got the house on the beach. Yeah. Todd McFarlane's going, bud, bud, Mark is making all the money. Mark, Mark <laughs> is making all, all the, the royalties. Are X-Men. The royalties are big. They're big. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, Todd became everybody's business manager. You got a pencil, you got an ink, you got to be on an X book. Yeah, I'm taking Spider Man to New Heights, you know. And and the end and the end result was, you know, I never left the X office. Once yeah. I was in there, like, here, draw this annual. And they said, Rob, we're going to take time. Here's how cool Marvel was. They knew that they were going to move on from this team. Yeah. But they said one of the guys on the team had just had a baby. They want to give him six more months. So I waited six more months. Did did I did issues of X Factor. I did issues of X-Men. They took care of me. And then when it was time, they said, you can go with your vision. And they said, fill this with your own stuff, which I did. And, and you know, Mark, it, it worked out for me. And uh, But again, I was hungry. And I had that same uh, almost desperation. M maybe that's what Shooter had. Like, I have to make yeah. this work. Yes. I have yeah. to. If I want that promotion, people would always say to me, they'd say, Rob, why did you fill... Um, the new mutants with cable and Deadpool. I said, because I wanted to work. I wanted to have a job next month. But that like, was Jack Kirby in 1961. And that was Jerry Siegel oh, in 1938. Yep. You know, it's like hunger is an amazing motivator, isn't it? You, yeah. you know, this is going to go away unless you seize the opportunity. You know? That's right. That's exactly right. But it's um, funny, I hadn't actually considered until just now how similar our paths were, which was I had a breakout at DC. Yes. found it a really unpleasant experience. Like, all my life I'd wanted to work at DC and then I was there and I hated it. I mean, it sounds like you had a pretty horrible sort of time there briefly before you went to Marvel. Then I went to Marvel and had Ultimate X-Men straight in at number one. So it's kind of a similar path, which I hadn't actually thought of before. Had you, when you went to DC, was it the summit of your aspirations or did you always have your eye on Marvel? Because for me, DC was what I really wanted, but I hated it when I was in there, you know? Well, I, uh, this is funny. I kept, uh, I kept asking I, I wanted to do a fill-in on Justice League because that Kevin Maguire Justice League had just become the rage. Yeah. And uh You're doing guys, great like, Justice League. guys like Andy Helfer and, and yeah. guys like Mark Wade said, No, you can't do Justice League. No, you can't do the Legion. So I did Hawk and Dove, and I gotta be honest, Mark, I wasn't impressed with how they were treating me. Yeah. Um uh 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 so 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 I always loved the X-Men. Yeah. And and uh I I was, you know. My favorite character of all space and time is Wolverine. Right. He hit me at an age. I, I met him when I was seven years old, eight years old. And I, I, I always say I love the the hot tempered guys. I love mm -hmm. Prince Namor. I love Luke Cage Power Man. Yeah. I love the thing. And then I found my 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 perfect mate in Wolverine. Yeah. So I I knew I would draw a good Wolverine again. Now, irony is I did an issue of X-Men and he's never in costume. Yeah. Wolverine's just kind of in a jacket and it's kind of a joke issue. Claremont was doing like a parody of DC's invasion. Mm -hmm. And I think I was picked because I had just come from DC. Right. Uh, but no, I mean, look, I think everything worked out with me because of Marvel, but do I believe I could have made some special books at DC? And then I can back that up by saying I made Hawk and Dove a hit. You know what that <laughs> when I, I told Mike Carlin I was leaving, he's like, oh, wh why? We just, we created something special here. I said, working with you has been miserable. You have yeah. been awful to me. Yeah. And and uh, they're just taking you because of the opportunities we gave you. I'm like, yeah. Like when I started my Extreme Studios with that in mind, I stood yeah. up and told everybody, I will never ask for your loyalty. Yeah. I will try and earn it. But if there's a better job elsewhere, take it. Also, like, just being nice to work with goes a long way as well. You know, like, that's it. I mean, that bullying culture at DC at the time was horrific. I mean, Mike Carlin was a very objectionable character, I think, you know. Yes. And, but he apparently learned it at the foot of Jim Shooter, people would say, you know, who learned it at the Jim foot. fired him. Jim fired him. So, and yeah. Jim, Jim, apparently, people say, learned it from uh, the old Superman editor, Mark Wiesinger, when he was a kid, you know. Okay. So, it's okay. this weird cycle that's going on. So, yeah. I don't know who Mike Carlin has beaten down emotionally or whatever at DC, you know, like who's who's like that now, you know. Oh, I don't know if this oh there's a brotherhood. Or... There's a brotherhood of us. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but like I said, you know, I really felt like I could have stood out. And and Mark, I remember Richard Starkings. Mm -hmm. I rue the day. He called me in 99 and he said, yeah. Rob, there is a guy doing Superman adventures that you have got to get familiar with and you need to ask him to write supreme he is fantastic his name is mark miller i thought you were going to say the guy before me the guy before me was very good he was very you. good <laughs> and then the next thing i know you turned authority into the best comic in uncanny x-men with claremont and burn 
and The Authority with you and Frank are my two favorite team books ever, wow. ever. That's amazing. Um, I, look, I, oh, my wife will be like, don't, no, he's not going to tell me about authority again. No, <laughs> no, I don't. Because now I added an extra wrinkle. Last Friday night when we were out, I, I added an extra wrinkle about the only reason the boys yeah. is on TV is because Paul Levitz freaked out at the authority and the boys yeah. and made sure they all went away because <laughs> he couldn't handle it. He couldn't handle seeing these these compromised visions of yeah. popular icons. Oh, and I mean, the guys hated it. The DC guys yeah. all hated it. They couldn't yeah. wait to get us out of the building. So and, when we and, went to Marvel, nobody called us and tried to get us back. They were like, off you go. This is fine. You know. I was at lunch with Bill Jemis. My Wolverines were coming out uh, yeah. in, the, in the late late summer, early fall. Yeah. And Bill Jemis said, Rob, we've got Mark, Mark Miller. We've got him. He's coming over to do Ultimate X-Men. He's going to do um, a, a, another book for us. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I think the first thing I said is, does that mean he's not going to do the authority? <laughs> Mark, you know, I'm, I'm one of those guys and I know it, 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 but I, there's a lot of guys like me. I tell people, okay, I forgot the name, but I can tell you every image. The second arc you did when the magician is released from prison and says, we're going to oh, fight, yes. empty the planet. That's a good and fight. There's all these portals and you're empty. Everyone is going to another dimension so that the authority yeah. and this sorcerer can battle. And I'm like, what is going on? Mark, imagine I'm, I'm, imagine I'm, anyone other than Frank quietly drawing that though. I mean, like, no, you know, no. he, he brings that to life, isn't it? Although, I mean, people although, say, is it the writer or is it the artist? I think it's about 75% the artist. I honestly yeah. do, you know, and you do need both of you, but it's a, it's a visual medium, isn't it? And he made that look epic. I mean, he's a genius. I'd Mark, never say this to his face, ideas. but he is a genius. I, no, no, he's a genius. The yeah. ideas that you guys were putting forth, it was the most inspirational comic. Mark, I, you know, the same that I said, I said to Mark Silvestri in, in New York, I said, Mark, I told you this when I, you showed me these. You are the only artist that makes me want to quit <laughs> work harder simultaneously. Yeah. yeah. I look at your work and I go, I never, ever want to draw another comic. I'm humiliated. And then get up off the ground and aspire to this, yes. you know, and the authority was that book that was at the right time at the right place. The X-Men was not doing well. The Justice League was in shambles. And that was the, the book everyone was talking about. Your and Frank. I know that Ellis and Hitch had set it up. People liked it. I, it wasn't for me. But when you guys came on it, and I was even telling my wife about how you made Jack Krigstein. Kirby was the, the <laughs> idea. Siphoner and the government is... I mean, Mark, th this is genius stuff. It is... I was... Uh, so I, I, at that point, I'd been in the business 14 years. Yeah. It was a shot in the arm. It inspired me. It absolutely inspired you know, me. One thing that could be nice to hear for people who are struggling is I literally didn't have two pennies to rub together when I was doing it. Like, I was in the verge of giving up. And it's funny, like you say, you know, when it's desperation. Like, yeah. I'd been around for about a decade. Nobody had really been interested in anything I'd done. And it's wow. kind of like Stan Lee in the early 60s or Siegel yeah. and Schuster when they're hawking Superman around. Sometimes you have to be almost giving up, don't you? And then it, it works, doesn't it? So it was just luck. But sorry, just to, just to get back to you, though, you know what I'm so curious about? Because there's nobody who's a bigger Marvel fan I can think of than you or, or comic book fan in general. But yeah. you weren't at Marvel a huge amount of time before you went off to do Image. Was that weird for you? Because it's something you'd probably dreamed of since you were five years old, you know? And then suddenly this opportunity arises was it a difficult decision or did it just really feel like the right thing to do when you guys went off and foreign damage with a huge well, success that you had no, no 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 you know what i i say this you know mark i can remember it like it was yesterday and, yeah. I, and again i didn't have friends for two years again this is all stuff that's fresh i was discussing with my wife the other night yeah she knows all the same people you know we, we grew up together in this area and i said for two two years i just had to say i can't go out i can't go out penciling inking and writing a book mm -hmm. was a ton of work it yeah. was much more than just hey i'll pencil this mm -hmm. and so new mutants once i introduced cable it blows up and there was always they told me i was going to be able to write the book mm -hmm. and i held them to it and so uh the previous writer exited on the crossover and after they did this extinction agenda crossover and see even then that crossover i was in on the planning of that and if you look at Extinction Agenda, which fans loved, yeah, it was all set up to for Jim to shine. Mm -hmm. You know, Jim Lee got 
all these key Wolverine moments. Mm -hmm. He got Wolverine battling Archangel. He got Wolverine with Psylocke tearing through Madripoor. Yeah. They were all key moments. He even got to draw Cable and the New Mutants like alongside the X-Men in a way that the fans wanted. The X-Factor book and the New Mutants book were kind of like just kind of sister sister chapters. Yeah. But the important chapters were for Uncanny X-Men. So I only laid out my portions to buy me time to get started on New Mutants 98. And I knew like they've Marvel, the fans have rewarded me with great sales and favor, but Marvel has now basically said, we're going to give you everything you want. Mm -hmm. And so New Mutants 98 sells 750,000 copies. Yeah. No, no extra cover, no scratch and sniff, no acetate, no glow in the yeah. dark. People love Deadpool. They love Domino. They tell me the biggest mail ever, which now only... Uh, bolsters the argument I had been making for seven years. Because trust me, I, I tell people, and I'll reenact it with you right now. Todd's Spider-Man came out, the one that sold 3 million copies. Mm -hmm. And it was the talk of that week that it came out in the summer. The day it came out, that Friday, I'd gone to two stores to see how it was selling. And I had bought some and I got home, my phone rang. It was three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, Southern California. Jim Lee was in San Diego. I pick up the phone and I said, hello. And Jim said, it's me. I said, no, I know, Jim, it's you. He goes, no, 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 next year, it's me. I'm the guy. I said, what? He goes, yeah, yeah, I, uh, X-Men number one. I'm, I'm getting the treatment, X-Men number one. And I've told everybody, yeah. my heart sank. I sat on the bed and I'm like, I'm going to lose the race. I'm going to be left behind. It's going to be the Todd and Jim show. Right. And the hell if I'm going to go along with that. And yeah. I immediately... I hung up and I said, hey, Marvel, look at my sales on New Mutants. Look at the trajectory. We've added 300,000 sales since I brought over. Mm -hmm. I've said to you from the for day one, New Mutants is a hard title to sell. I mean, a hard title to say New Mutants. It doesn't roll off your tongue. New Mutants, New Mutants. I yeah. said, let's get an X on this. Let's call it X-Force. Let's call it Executioners. Let's call it X-Anything. Mm -hmm. And there's a guy in sales there who was like, I will support you in this. Mm -hmm. And... uh and he said, I will, I just got to make sure they're, they're, they're okay. She's got it. <laughs> uh, I said, I said, uh, you know, you, you just got to get behind me. And he's like, Rob, I'll do it. Mark early, late that summer, we put together a package. Yeah. He did a write up on the trajectory of sales and they said, declined. We are not going to give you a new number one. And I go, but, but new means 100 is coming up and we can, we can translate. I'm going to, bringing all these other characters. We're going to, I was pleading. I'm in Southern California pleading. And uh, they go, they get more of the sales team behind me mm -hmm. and they make a second presentation and Tom DeFalco and the powers that be turn it down. And Mark, I don't know why th the third time was the charm, mm -hmm. but right in September, October of 1990, they said, Rob, they, they, they've looked at the opportunities and, and they've reconsidered it and it's all systems goal. It's all systems go. You're going to get, you're going to get your X force book. It's going to launch before Jim's Jim is not going to be out till late summer of 91. You're going to get yours. And I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> so when new mutants is selling out and then Mark new mutants, 100 had nothing going for it. Yeah. But cut one cover. It's the best selling last issue of any comic ever. It sold a million copies. There's a reason there's three different covers. It kept going back to press. They change it. Uh, silver ink, gold ink, bronze ink original is a purple cover and bob harris calls me and goes rob we're selling a million of this yeah. i mean like it and, and and i've been going to comic stores and doing signings for every issue every month yeah and suddenly i'm pulling up and there's 300 400 500 like what's going on the favor was there yeah so then x-force hits and it's a giant hit and yes it's got five covers and five trading cards and but we carry the momentum. And then Mark, you sit there and, and here's the thing I'm sitting there holding it going. Okay. Spider-Man is Spider-Man. He's the biggest character in Marvel's arsenal. You know, now Todd does one of the best Spider-Man of all time. Yeah. And that's why fans have such an adoration for it to this day. Wolverine is the number one character at Marvel for 20 years. And Jim drew a badass Wolverine and he succeeded in convincing Mo Claremont to make the book more Wolverine esque again. But X-Force to quote, when I called my buddy Todd, I've done this on my podcast. I'll do this on video. <clears throat> I was insecure because, oh man, what are my numbers going to be? What are my numbers going to be? Bud, bud, what? 
is an X-Force. I mean, I mean, everyone knows, everyone knows Spider-Man. Everybody knows Spidey. And everybody knows X-Men. Everybody knows X-Men. Okay. So, 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 so I, I gotta tell you, what is an X-Force? I think, but you're going to do a mill. You're going to sell 1 million and you're going to be thankful and happy. I mean, because nobody knows these characters. <laughs> What? <laughs> okay, like take that five million and shove it up your ass. Okay, uh, bud, bud. Okay, like I guess that was conventional logic, but dude, here, let me do this. Let me let me show you something. Here, I'll just reach over here. Oh, <laughs> hi, bud, bud, bud. Uh, here, here's a little cable for you. Oh, oh. Oh, here's a little Deadpool. Here's a little <laughs> Iron Pool. Hey, oh, who are these characters? Nobody knows who they are. Bud, bud, there's a mini <laughs> cable. All right, here, here's freaking Deadpool on a scooter. Okay, I mean, good God Almighty. Here, here's here's cable. Here's cables pop. Hello, hello, I'm a Funko Pop. Oh, here, let me let me let me give you the best, the greatest Deadpool statue ever, right over here. I mean, good God Almighty. Look, man. Young Rob Liefeld was a freaking hurricane meets yeah. a cyclone meets a whirlwind. And I would just go, everybody's betting against me. And to this day, Bob Harris, I give him, he just said, you know, I'm going to let this kid run. Because when I look at X-Force number one, and it took yeah. me 20 years to really, I go, no one on the cover of X-Force number one existed. Yeah. 16 months earlier. That's incredible. Months. That that's like 1961, isn't it? That's like 1961. That's crazy. And, and you know what? Yeah. To this day, you know, as I'm as I'm, you know, uh, I mean, here, we'll, let's go to my here. I, I'll carry you with me. I'm on my I'm on my rollers. Mm -hmm. I'm on my rollers. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Okay, look look at that shelf. Look at that shelf. That you know, I mean, I look at all look at all this crazy merchandise. And yes, people, <laughs> don't be concerned. Rob gets his royalty checks. <laughs> Don't worry about me, okay? <laughs> Look at all this. Look at Cable and Deadpool and Lady Deadpool. And there's Ryan Reynolds' D Deadpool. And I mean, I mean, Mark, I mean, you know, I, I think I did okay. I believed in myself. And what happened is, then Marvel calls me and says, Rob, we're making all your characters. In They're the second wave of X-Men toys. And why that's important to people is there had been no X-Men toys. The yeah. X-Men was the number one thing for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And there had been no action figures. And now they've, and the cartoon's not out yet. The cartoon isn't coming for two yeah. and a half more years. But just based on X-Men popularity. And so I am, it is late night. I got my nightlight on. It's, you know, 9.45, 10 o'clock Pacific time. And I get a call from Bob Harris, mm -hmm. who's just leaving the office. And he says, oh, Rob, the toy people came in today. They saw all your designs and they said, we have to make these into toys. We need another wave in, in, in the second wave. We need an additional wave to make it because, and, and Avi Arad met with me and said, you create characters that are very toyetic. I go, what the hell is toyetic? <laughs> these are very toyetic, very, very playable. These are, these are very, very hardware meets software software meets hardware and i'm like i don't know what the hell that means just make me some damn action figures okay so so i've got my wish i mean look everywhere i reach in my house on my desk i mean so deadpool cable domino x-force what do you do for an encore mark i wasn't going to go do the fantasy four i was like i got some mo right now i got some heat yeah todd had retired the you know todd, when x-force 3 came out todd retired yeah he, he that was his last issue of spider-man and and so then I said, I'm going to go the creator owned route. I'm going to follow in the footsteps of Chaken and Starlin. Well, and is this is this before Todd said he was doing Spawn? Uh, I am the first image comic book all by myself for three months for a reason. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Todd, Todd, Youngblood comes out April 1992, yeah. March 1992. Mm -hmm. Todd comes out July. Right. Um, and now, Todd, I was reading a Comics Journal interview in 1991. He's like, Rob didn't tell me what he was doing. And yeah. I'm like, no, you were trying to make a sports trading card company. Mm -hmm. And he spent, I've got the original sheet, the roll. I took it out the other day. Yeah. He was going to call his company Front Row. 
because there was a popular American company called Upper Deck. Mm -hmm. And he said, who'd want to sit in the upper deck when you can sit in the front row? <laughs> and he bought hockey pictures. Yeah. And he drew the backs of Wayne Gretzky and Brett Hall. And he did all these. And he got as far as the NHL and they turned him down. Yeah. And then ran back to comics. He said, okay, I'll do what you guys are doing. He was always looking for a way out of comics. And, and uh, finally the toys did for him what the trading cards wouldn't. But um, I mean, hats off to Todd, unlike anybody else, yeah. you know, you can't deny he stuck with Spawn. And he'd always say, I only got one. You guys got a million ideas. I only got one. I only <laughs> got one. And I'm like, no, I see it. You protect that one idea. Like it's, you know, so, so doing image and extending, because look, Mark, let's say my deal called that I got 5% of everything. 5% mm -hmm. of cable, my 1990 deal said 5% of everything. Mm -hmm. I said, what if I get 95% of everything? Mm. What, if I, what if I get a hundred, yeah. you know? And, yeah. and so for me, it was, I had to roll the dice and the fans followed me I've, I've all, uh, in keeping with what I just told you. And you've experienced this. You you've experienced this yourself. Yeah. Someone bought kick-ass number one or Kingsman or mm. Jupiter's legacy or all the other books I've loved from you. They're buying Mark Millar number one, mm. um, especially early on. Image year one, you're buying Todd McFarlane, number one, mm -hmm. Rob Liefeld. What's Youngblood? It doesn't have a history. It yeah. doesn't have any favorability. Yeah. You're buying Jim Lee, number one, Rob Liefeld, number one. Um, we were fortunate that the fans followed us. They had our, that we, and, and that, you want to talk about breaking a cycle. Yeah. That to this day, they're like image broke the Marvel zombie because the Marvel, this this store i keep telling you and i was in, hold that thought this store two days ago i was in the guy goes i can't get my marvel fans to buy any dc books because i looked at a couple of dc books and i said these look really good this is really good and he's like yeah but you can't get marvel fans to look at them they just walk right by and they go i'm just a marvel fan and i said buddy that's called a marvel zombie that's a, <laughs> that's existed for 40 years this isn't new because this kid's in his 20s you know and this is all like you can't believe his marvel fans won't buy dc yeah so we broke that but go ahead I was going to say, it's only just struck me really how interesting this is that you guys had each other as competitors and maybe made you better and hotter and yes. more ambitious. Oh. Like I, It'd been very interesting if you'd been around up against you know the Silverage guys who were content working for a paycheck and yeah. weren't even that bothered about their names being on the books sometimes, you know. But you, you seem to be a bunch of super ambitious young guys in your early 20s to late 20s who were friends, but actually competitors as well. And it's one of those things, you know, where you forge steel against steel, yes. and then you end up with something pretty tough, you know? And I, and it's interesting, you know, Jim phones you up to say he's got the X gig and everything, you know? Oh. It, it really, it's like a sports team, isn't it? I mean, it really is. But I also More. wonder, you know, sometimes in sports, you get a team doing really well because they've got five great players. You know, yes. it's not when there's one, it's because there's five. And yes. that's kind of what you guys really were, wasn't it? Oh, you no, you kind of needed numbers. each other too, didn't you? I think you need no, to each other. Mark, we only worked because we were together. Yeah. Image talked the world because, and they said to us, you won't last. Now we had our fallouts and we had our shifts and our changes. Yeah. Uh, Jim selling his company because he was in debt. People forget Wildstorm was in debt. He needed yeah. that deal. The only person who was willing to bite was DC. Um, the thing is, because he had put all his own money into making a Gen 13 cartoon that he could never release. I mean, right. and, and we shared an agent at the time. And yeah. my agent would call me up to whine about Jim investing. And I'm like, don't call, call Jim. Don't talk. No, you've got to get Jim to listen to me. Hey, dude, if he wants to put $2 million into an animated cartoon with girls smoking in their underwear that Disney is going to bury, <laughs> that's that's up to him. Um, I think Gen 13 got a screening yeah. at a half-packed Wizard World. Like Wizard World said, we're having a Gen 13. That, and that's the only time it was ever screened in public. You can't buy it. It doesn't exist. But it spelled the demise of Wildstorm before he sold it. But the bottom line is. But he took a risk, though, which is that's the personality of all you guys to try something new like that, though. Hats off to him. You know, I always were, think that's We were cool. the dream team. We you were know? the dream team. Yeah. We were absolutely the dream team. And we probably scared the entire industry. And uh, But you're right. No, no. I go back and go, what if Jim had kept his mouth shut? Yeah. What if he, because he was flexing on me. Yeah. I was yeah. getting like, hey, I'm the guy. <laughs> like, like, let's put any pretense away. I'm the guy. And I'm like, hung up that phone. My heart was racing. Yeah. I was like, I, I'm going to get left behind. 
they're getting special treatment. I have to wedge myself. Yeah. Um, so it's, top so, gun. Uh, it's essentially Top Gun, isn't it? Yeah. You know, yeah. you're in with the best pilots and yes. the Navy, aren't you? You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. I love it. I mean, Mark, we can sit here and talk about, dude, you're the success story, man. You're oh, the listen, guy. this is about you. This isn't about me. This isn't about me. So but I'll you know, have you on. I remember, I remember you told me a, such a, a fascinating story one time. Years ago, we were midnight in a hotel bar, and you said you were expecting the sales to come in maybe around 80 yeah. on, on Young Bloods, and they came in 10 times that. You know, it was like yes. completely nuts. And you actually thought there was a digit in the wrong place. It, it was so yes. big, you were unprepared for it, you know? No, that's right. And that's that's the best feeling in the world, doesn't it? I mean, that's that's incredible. Mark, it's so, uh, so my dad, he had been ill on and off. Another part of my passion was I, I wanted to provide for my parents. My dad had, had uh, by that time, probably his third bout with brain cancer. And oh my God. Had, had, he, he had lost one eye when I was uh, nine years old. He, mm -hmm. he, he basically had it sewn shut because that eye was dead because of the tumor behind it. Um, it was kind of a constant at the time. And so I was doing very well. I was, I had bought them a house in, in uh, off, off Marvel royalties, but my dad came to me and he said, son, I see the money that you're getting from Marvel on this X-Force book. I just, are you making the right, right decision? And I said, dad, if I just sell a hundred thousand copies, yeah, I'll basically make the same money that I am selling a million for Marvel. Mm -hmm. And I think I can sell what I was doing at that point. Cause by that point, Mark, yeah, X-Force is regularly by issue x force four x force five we're doing a we're doing a million copies mm. you know we did five second issue was almost two million yeah you know we're gonna fall but like even even if i'm only selling nine hundred thousand, mm -hmm. i'm basing my success yeah. walking away from marvel on doing 10 percent that number mm -hmm. and that's what i told you and that's when i was like what yeah and mark mark no one believed Eric Larson and Jim Valentino and I had been talking about doing a conclave, a little artist group, yeah, our own label. Mm -hmm. But I was the one because I tell everybody I was young, stupid. I didn't have kids. I wasn't married. I had nothing. Jim Valentino married. Mark Sylvester in a long term relationship. Jim Lee married with a kid on the way. Todd married with a newborn. Eric Larson married with a kid on the way. Everybody else had something to lose. Yeah. Little Robbie with the hard head said, "I'll run through that wall." Watch, watch me. And uh, because I'm like, what well, here, here's it. Here, let me tell you something else Todd said. I mean, everybody keeps saying we're taking a big risk. It's not a risk. If 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 if, if it doesn't work out, we, we all go work for DC. And I'm like, <laughs> That's it. It's not like DC wouldn't have taken us. Uh hi, Marvel hates us. Do you wanna can we work for you? Um, you know, I mean, there was always an out, but but I just figured that I could make this work yeah. um, based on 10% because, yeah. you know, I know this sounds ridiculous to your fans, not to your fans, our viewers, our mutual viewers on this. Uh, but at the time in 1991, I'm like, well, if I can make like $90,000 an issue, I'm, that's more money than I ever dreamed of. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, I just got a check for a million dollars yeah. for X-Force. I mean, you know, when it started, like I said, X Force number one, X Force yeah. one hundred, which went, went back to press three yeah. times, yeah. that was a juicy check. You're like, mm -hmm. what? Yeah. Wait, wow! And nobody that I know yeah. got into comics to make money. Not a single guy. No one. Jim Lee didn't get into comics to make. He he, he wanted to make a living. Mm -hmm. Todd wanted to make a living. I just wanted to do it. We all wanted to do what we love and get paid. Yeah. We we. My son is on set right now. Because he has to act. I see it. The way drawing is to me, it's his passion. Mm -hmm. he got He did a million auditions, tried out, came close on a million roles, callback, callback. But now I know he's living his life. The money doesn't matter to him. Yeah. He's just happy to be a working actor. We all, you all, we just wanted to make comics. It's our passion. Yeah. Then the opportunity to be rewarded for it came upon us. Yeah. And and if if we were responsible for some of it, great. Um, if 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 some of it was serendipity, great. No one's gonna give it back, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, no, I think we were ruthlessly ambitious, Mark. And then ruthlessly there was a guy mm -hmm. among us uh who said to Todd and Jim and myself, it won't he said at Marvel, it's you top you're the top three guys because Marvel put you top three guys. Mm -hmm. You better get ready to change. It's going to change. 
it won't be you guys anymore. When wow. it's a when it's a when it's a level playing field. Yeah. And me and Todd were like, pretty sure that's not gonna happen, but okay. <laughs> like if you want, but like that's the fire that was burning. Yeah. Like we yeah. did. It was like a sports team. We wanted to take each other out. We wanted to, you know, wear the crown, have yeah. the trophy. But I I mean I I don't see that same level of ambition today because I think it's been beaten out of people. Yeah. And I also think this generation, it's almost uncool to compete. But it's yes. like everyone's yeah. competing. Yeah. Everyone's competing. You and I have had emails. We know who's competing. Every single person that's listening to this was the sperm that beat the other two million sperms to the egg when they were conceived. Yeah. You know, it's like it's human, it. it's human nature, isn't it? Yeah. It's it's the NB five hundred from the minute we exist. You know. That's right. So, I mean, that's right. but I think it's fascinating though because you were so young, you know, you guys were so young and suddenly had all this dough, you know, and yeah. and you didn't probably have anyone who told you how to handle that as well. You know, all of you, for all nope. of you guys, you know, so nope. to, to go from guys who were just happy to be working to having this tremendous wealth and model girlfriends and all this kind of stuff and super fast cars and everything. I mean, yeah. did it turn your head a little for a little while before you, you know? Um, I counted on the fact that like everything, because yeah. again, keeping with sports, and I was a huge sports team. Yeah. In Los Angeles, my LA Lakers from the time that I was 12 yeah. were in eight NBA finals and we won five of them. And then one day it stops when sport teams, when sports teams fall off, it just ends, you know, yeah. in movie careers, whether it's Nick Cage, Will Smith, mm -hmm. these guys go on runs and the yeah. audience before them, it was Robert Redford. Sure. I stood up. Here's what I do with my money, Mark. I reinvested it in, talent I my studio at its peak at 65 people on site yeah. i created a computer coloring department mm -hmm. and i invested i i loved hiring new talent yeah. paying them extremely well i had a murderer's row of the best inkers yeah uh, i i had some great shiny new brand new talent um i reinvested in my own creative vision yeah. but i had set aside money and i once we got to about 15 20 employees I stood up on the top of the table. Mm -hmm. I said, I want to tell you guys, and everybody at my studio who was there remembers this like it was yesterday. They go, I remember you saying this. I said, I know things are crazy right now, and every book we have is selling a million, mm -hmm. but this is Camelot. Yeah. Camelot faded, and then they were all scattered looking for the grail. We are in the glory days of the kingdom, Yeah. but prepare yourself for when this ends. It will end. And I just don't know that, like, just like I said to people, if you want to leave, I, I'm never going to, I'm never going to go, oh, you should be loyal. Cause I wasn't loyal to Marvel. Yeah. I yeah. wasn't loyal to DC. I was loyal to me. Yeah. Uh, I've always had a very practical outlook, but for me, I just always knew it was kind of end. It was going to end. This was a cycle. Like you said, I, I was yeah. aware. So what I did much like yourself, I created a library of characters. I created you know, lots of stories uh, invested in talent and those live, that library is still mine. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, to, to shop, I get offers on it to, you know, what I did mm -hmm. to this day is I get offers every day. I, I was looking at contracts before I got on with you about two of my comic books mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, do I want to do this or do I want to, you know, maybe keep sitting on it? Cause I don't think these prices are what, what I believe is the true value of what I have. Cause yep. it's not again for, for me, I have a great life. I, 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 my, I put three kids through private schools, launched them into their own world. My wife and I married 27 years. I get to do what I love every single day. I am a, yeah. I am such a content man, yes. but my catalog, I'm not going to give away. Yeah. Um. And, uh, and, and so I kind of manage the, you know, the, I curate my characters. And if I pass it along to my kids, that'll be a great gift to them yeah. that they can curate and I'll give, I'll make sure if I'm, I already do tell them, call these two people if I unexpectedly pass. This is like Vito, Vito Corleone in the garden talking to Michael, isn't it? It is. <laughs> it is. But you know, so my, you know, but Mark, um, I was never into, I only got a fancy car because yeah. everyone told me to get a fancy car because all my yeah. partners had yeah. fancy cars. <laughs> but I'm really, you know, uh, bought some properties, bought a lot of art, got some yeah. fun stuff. But, you know, my biggest investment was my Extreme Studios, which we ran for six years. And now, you know, Mark, I get together with these guys. I'm going to tell you, mm, some of the talent that was in my studio is working on my son's show. Oh, really? And they're like, dude, 
That's crazy. Your son came into work today. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I forgot to tell you. And they're like, this is crazy. You gave me my first job. And now I'm working with your kid. It's like, we have a great bond. Yeah. We have great memories. The 90s were fantastic. And I'm going to tell you, man, I, because I do find this very relatable. The 2000s was also a whirlwind. It was a different whirlwind. Yeah. yeah. It was it was when the two Marvel and DC were becoming greater acceptance in the big major media yeah. landscape. And you were part of that. So you were, we never had the very, very, very first editorial retreat mm-hmm. was for uh, the sequel, the executioner song. Yeah. No, um, we, no, 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 no. The, the, the sequel, the extinction agenda, mm-hmm. extinction agenda was just, there was three books that were going to participate. Mm-hmm. New mutants, X factor, X-Men. Yeah. There weren't two X-Men books. The the second X-Men book hadn't come out yet. Mm-hmm. So we did that all over the phone. Yeah. While we were leaving for image, they flew us all out to talk about what was going to become the executioner song. Mm-hmm. And you could tell Jim, myself, Will, Smart, we were just unengaged. We were yeah. like, yeah. this isn't for us. But then your generation, because I've heard about it from Kirkman. I've heard about it from you, you know, uh, all the editorial retreats, the planning committees, the, you know, that that's a different era too. And, and, and uh, that was really crucial. Cause again, in the Marvel MCU making of the MCU book, they kind of chronicle some of what was going on in publishing at the time too, mm-hmm. and how to get it to come alongside the vision. Yeah. And so these were, we, we are both part of some of the most exciting times in the history of our craft. Yes, and we were very lucky it, in our, our era. I mean, it'd be awful uh, to be five years older or five years younger, and we just, honestly, just missed it, wouldn't it? It'd yes. be awful. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it's just it's it's not the same when you were there. Yeah. And it's not the same when I was there. Yeah. And we were both part of of different evolutions. But I think we're one both. thing you don't get enough credit for is that you had this, you know, incredible success, made a ton of cash, but you really spread it around. You know, yes. like. There was a lot of pros who made a lot of dough. And I spoke to some of them at the time and you'd hear things and and you couldn't believe it. I mean, I remember hearing one guy, I don't know if this is true, was getting 150 grand an issue for dialogue. You know, was that true? Um, that that wasn't in my office, but it was some, somewhere. But was I mean, crazy, crazy amounts of money because, I mean, back in those days, a typical Marvel or DC book paid two grand to write the issue, you know? Right. And and you guys were paying 10, 100 times that sometimes, no. you know? So, so here's some the people deal. were getting... Get- Dale Keown kept yeah. turning Mark, uh, Dale Keown, who was on the Hulk, kept turning Todd down when Todd would say, come over and do a book with us, come over. I said, screw it, I'll take care of it. There's a reason there's a 10-page backup feature in Youngblood number four. I yeah. said, "What? we're not speaking this guy's language. I said, Dale, I'll pay you $1,000 a page. Would you like to do that for 10 pages? Yeah. And again, that that's three months work to do 10. So then after that, like there was an artist named Stephen Platt. He was doing Moon Knight. Yeah, I love saving stuff. Yeah. I think he was doing two thousand dollars an issue, and I mm-hmm. said, "I'm going to pay you forty grand a comic yeah. to come." Mark, uh, he he signed the don, uh, he signed the contract that night. Yeah. Um, there there was my inkers. Danny Mickey had never inked a comic before. All, a lot of my new inkers, I gave them three hundred and fifty dollars a page. Yeah. And Danny, Danny never didn't do three dollars three pages a day back then. Danny Mickey is making. I mean, he's making eleven hundred dollars a day, seven days a week. Yeah. Jeff Matsuda, a guy I flew out, got his first. I did. The, I I paid him a thousand dollars a page. Yeah. Turned in a comic in a week. Then I gave him another double sizer. He did that in two weeks. Yeah. And I had a house. I had a house that I had bought that I was housing different talent. It had four rooms, mm-hmm. and I had put Jeff in that house. Really nice house in Orange County. And he came in one day and he goes, hey, Rob, I just want to let you know my room is going to be free. I'm moving out. I go, you've only been here like six weeks. He goes, I know, but with the money you're paying me, I already bought a car. I just bought my <laughs> uh, I'm moving out. And I go, okay. <laughs> so look, again, I want to, I want to, for Danny Mickey, yeah, an anchor to be making $350 a page. Mm, that's great. Three pages a day. I yeah. mean, again, that's, you know, there were guys who tried to get those right rates as the nineties were ending. And it's like, I know you're not getting that from Marvel. Hmm. Why you Marvel's paying you 120. Yeah. And you're asking me now to pay you 300. I'm not doing that. That, yeah. that, yeah. that I paid you when I could afford to be super generous. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, 
Mark, Mark, it was it was stupid money. It was it, it was money. it was kind though as well, you know. And I think it's it's good if you if you do well to share it around. You know, and I I love the fact when we sold our company to Netflix. When we, I mean, Netflix owned it the yeah. way Disney and Marvel. A lot of artists made more money for four issues than they made in years at DC or Marvel. You know, they got super. So it's it's a nice feeling, isn't it? Because we grew up in a time when you saw comic guys ripped off or poor and everything. You yes. Know, so if you if you can help out in some way, you know and make sure some of your friends get good deals. You know I mean? I, I've got a lot of admiration for what you did. It was great. It, it, I'm going to tell you something. I think we got the fire between us. I wanted to bring this up. I've become friends with Jim Starlin over the years and we shared some representation. And yeah. when they opened the Disney, uh, I, I, I had already been to a million events and hung out with Jim and he, he's always like, Oh my gosh. Cause I, cause I get, super fangirl yeah. out over Jim and I'll be like, do you remember when you drew that, that issue of Avengers with Warlock? And he's like, yeah, man. Yeah, man. He's the coolest guy. But we had both been to, they were opening Avengers campus mm-hmm. at Disneyland. They're, they're Avengers theme park. Yeah. And so Jim and I went for the opening. And so we were walking around the park and I said, Jim, can I ask you a comic book question? And he's like, yeah, sure. I said, I had my peers that I was really competitive with. And mm-hmm. who was your guy? who is your guy? And Mark, he literally with his sunglasses on, he turned to me and says, Rob, it was Howie. It was always <laughs> me and Howie. And I go, shaking? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was always measuring myself against Howie and yeah. Howie was measuring. And I'm like, I love hearing how yes. competitive they were with each other. And again, look at Starlin's body of work. Yeah. But I'm also pivoting from when you said the time, the guys who were before us, it kills me that they didn't have those deals, those, uh, what do they call them? Participation deals, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. character royalties. Because Mark, I have my original, very yellow paper documents with the Marvel masthead that I signed. Because I'm like, because Todd would say, one day I got that call, Bud, well, everybody's talking about you. Like you're, you're, you're creating all these new characters, characters, like, and now everyone else is like, well, when are you going to create a character? What, why are you doing this? What, why? Why are you creating all these? And I said, uh, Todd, I'm, I'm pretty sure your deal looks like mine. It says, if I, if this, if this succeeds, I get 5% of this. Why wouldn't I? I said, I'm also not drawing Spider-Man. No one's ever heard of any of my characters. I have got to build my own sandbox. Hmm. You have the Spider-Man sandbox. Everybody knows Spider-Man and Craven and Doc Ock and, and Mysterio. I said, I'm trying to build something here. Mm-hmm. It kills me that the guys that did Wolverine uh, didn't have that opportunity. It was just yeah. part of their job. Mm-hmm. Make, put this new character in hand and, and you know, make yeah. this and make that. Um, those deals opened up because Shooter realized and he, in his interviews, he said, I was going to lose everybody yeah. to DC or to yeah. First Comics or Dark Horse because yeah. these deals were opening up. So I'm again, bene- I was the beneficiary of, I get a piece of my characters and it survives um, and it has survived. And, and uh, I, I, I would be one of those angry guys writing yeah. letters and making angry tweets. I'm so mad at me. I can't <laughs> bear to watch another Deadpool. But it's uh, funny, desperation on Shooter's part as well created huge success for Shooter as well, isn't it? Sometimes you have to be backed into that corner. For everything to go and great, so, Can I, but, you know, this is. I'm thinking like about this point. Then, so you must have got married mid nineties or something. Then, yeah, uh, 1995. Yes, sir. Yeah, because I was just thinking like uh, I've never met your wife, but I I always heard this rumor. Somebody said to me, "Is she one of three triplets?" She's a triplet. I is that true? Triplet. Yes, sir. I did. I okay. Uh, <laughs> so, so they did a lot of Hollywood stuff. They all have wigs on in this picture because they were on a uh, a television show. But yeah, she. Pick, you That's know, crazy. <laughs> some, sometimes I can't pick her out. The, that is uh, insane. This is a show uh, called Ned and Stacy that had Deborah yeah. Messing before Will and Grace. Yeah. And so they always got the triplet role. Um, yeah, no, no, no. She, uh, she and her sisters had a contract with Disney. They did a couple of parent trap. They did. So Haley Mills uh, was in both of the yeah. parent trap sequels that they were yeah. in. They were the yeah. triplets. But yeah, no, they did. Uh, Movies, television, and, and you know, my wife, um, like we're just talking, how my son, how ruthless it is yeah. trying to get roles mm-hmm. and audition. Now imagine that you're going up against your sister for everything. Oh my they God. All, yeah. Because yeah. two of them decided to stick with acting. 
Yeah. And my wife literally was like, I'm not having that. I'm not going <laughs> up against them. Like, what are we doing? Like, like I've competed against them my whole life, she said. Now I'm going to compete against them for my for my like, paychecks? No. And, uh, and the only one of them has stayed in acting, but has done yeah. it her whole life. And the uh, the other one went on to the producing side of things. Right. So yeah, no, there you go. But my, there, one there. of my brothers is married to a twin, right? And the twin, whatever period in their life, always lives about 400 yards from her sister, you know? I mean, yeah. do you have the triplets all living near each other? Are you all kind of nearby? Uh, no, they, 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 the, the two sisters live in LA. We're about an hour away. And, right. uh, you know, we see enough of them. <laughs> but quite a few of my friends are married to twins as well. And it's like, they said it's like being married to multiple people, you know? I mean, is it that kind of thing then? The same kind of intensity? Uh, you know, uh, my, my wife is distinct. She, they all, like, I think the reason my wife has always said, the reason I really took to you is you knew who I was immediately. Yeah. I did not, I would like, People, I, I I can't tell you how many people I saw from yeah. as a teenager on would yeah. come over and go, so which one are you? Oh, your stock will drop immediately. <laughs> tell an identical person. Which one are you? I, yeah, yeah. I can't tell you apart. No, my wife is very individual, very unique in and of herself. They do not share the same. They, they could not be. All three of them are so different. Tell me so this. Different. And any psychic stuff? Because uh, no, I... The, my brother's wife, like she'll be making dinner or something and her twin sister rings the doorbell and she brings her something she needs to make the dinner. They don't even say anything to each other. It's like having no. four arms and then she leaves. Nothing like that. No? I believe twins have that bond. Mm. But I think once you split it into three, it breaks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, 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 don't, I don't, I've never heard that. I've heard a lot with twins, but not with triplets. Well, before we wrap up, yeah. I'm kind of curious about this because... Like we say, comics is in a funny place. Comic movies are in a funny place and everything right now, you know? Like, do you think, you know when a kid wears a, a brace on their leg and then yeah. the muscle slightly wastes and then when you take the brace off, it can't run? Yes. I wonder if comic book movies have done this a little bit with comic books, you know, where comic books are so in awe of Hollywood that they forget that actually comics is a pretty cool thing in its own right. You know, so everybody's looking to have an agent and all this kind of... And I think some, and I know this sounds crazy for me because I literally have a day job as an executive in a Hollywood studio, right? But I think I try and almost divorce myself when I'm doing comics from the idea that it is anything else, you know? Like to me, the comics thing is the purest form. It's so interesting, isn't it? It's so fun to do. You never have to think about budget. You work with the best artists in the world. It's awesome, you know? Do you think we need to get back to that a little bit and just kind of forget Marvel movies and focus on Marvel comics? Do you think that's what's going wrong with Marvel and DC? They've got their eye on Hollywood too much. Mark, I, you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to close by saying, hey, everybody listening right now, comics is still, you know, the, the most accessible way to just tell your stories. Mm -hmm. if, if you can't write and draw yourself, find a buddy, tell stories. It's also the cheapest way you're going to tell a story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially if you can get a collaborator and the two you get together. And I was on a panel uh, with Jack Kirby in in LA in 1991 and somebody asked him about Hollywood and obviously they weren't anywhere near what they were doing now I mean we're those 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 Hulk movies with uh, Daredevil were on and and Hulk and Thor were on NBC like that was the stuff yeah. and uh and Jack said the greatest thing about my job is I can control I can I can make entire worlds for the price of my pencil and my paper. That's amazing. I he love says, that. He says, I, I can I can create entire galaxies and destroy them, you know, with my pencil and my paper. I, I have an unlimited, he said, my imagination has an unlimited budget. And I'm like, I was like, ah, this man is a god among us. He's a genius. He was just, and Roz, his wife is in the front row, just smiling at beaming, <laughs> just beaming. And trust me, that's this is how Jack talked. Stan was like, true believer, Ra Mark Miller. I love your work. I think it's <laughs> wait for it, kick ass. Okay. <laughs> Stan and Jack don't talk the same. That is how Jack talked. But I remember to this day going, he's right. Yeah. And when people come up to me and they go, Mr. Leifel, do you have? I said, tell your stories, tell it on paper, put everything you have. Because we are now in an, in an age where you can show those pictures on Instagram, on Facebook, on all the social media. But the bottom line is, Mark, 
when I do something new, my new project I'm doing is if, if it was to be put on a budget, it would be 300 million. Un mm. It'd be ridiculous. Yeah. Eventually someone will try and tell me how less to, how to make it for less. I just, I still am in a long-term romance with comic books. Yeah. The movies are interesting because they become an incredible distraction mm -hmm. and they've turned around careers. Mm. Uh, they turned around Robert Downey Jr.'s career. He yeah. was on TV. He was Ali McBeal, you know, and we loved it. We watched Ali McBeal. We were all, oh, but then Iron Man brought him all the way back yeah. beyond what he ever was. It gave all the Chris's, you know, Pratt, Evans, Hemsworth. So, so as a society, we are definitely fascinated. What, what I didn't anticipate 10 years ago mm -hmm. is how they would be so crucial to making or break people's careers that people need a superhero movie they need yeah. the their breakout role is the superhero they're about to play, play right yeah. um i think like i said we're going to find a new age of more mature material and maybe it's the next thing you have coming up on netflix because i'll watch it i'll engage with it i'll evaluate it um the the the, the more mature the material you know the the these grabbing another photo these two kids, the, the, these two boys, okay, this is probably 10 years ago. Yeah. These two boys were raised on, on Marvel films and they possibly have grown out of them as they exist right now. Yeah. yeah. And what are you going to give them to keep them engaged? Okay. What are you going to give them? Because they grew up on you, but like everybody, we change our diet. We change our tastes. Mm -hmm. we, we, you know, and uh, I mean, they've both called me up and said, dad, have you watched the boys dad the yeah. boys is, well and of course they like the boys it's yeah. vulgar it's yeah. violent it's mature so wherever comic book films go i just i don't want it to dictate what i do and you know what mark i'm blessed i get to draw for a living i i, I i've had a great career i i intend to keep drawing up you know kurt swan was drawing supreme when he died and they called us to tell us that he passed away. He was drawing Alan Moore's Supreme. And we got the call and Eric, my editor came in and said, Hey, Rob, you can ask Eric Stevenson. Uh, I know you work with him in image comics. Sometimes he was, he said, Rob Kurt Swan died. And uh, they, the, the, the family called to say, obviously, you know, he was drawing your story, but, and you know, to this day we're like, Oh, we never saw any of it. We didn't see it. We just know that's what he was doing. But I Have go, you ever I, seen the pages since? No, they've never, never appeared. We've never asked for them. We didn't uh, want to be, we yeah. didn't want to cross that, that boundary. He's my all-time favorite. I love him. This is 1996. Exactly. And Alan had talked him into doing this. Yeah. Uh, but I just hope I die at my drawing board. I yeah. hope I die drawing comics. In a while. Hope, not anytime soon. In a while. Well, you know, so but, like, but I just, I have a romance with comics and it's not, you know, it's not based on um, whether... Like, look, do I live in a world where I get the benefits that that Ryan Reynolds took super popular Deadpool and made him worldwide global phenomenon? Yes, I do. Do I get the benefit that Josh Brolin appeared as Cable? I do. Um, I'm not going to deny that. That's fun. But that is that doesn't sustain. They're on to their next roles. They're on to their next movies. And what are you going to do? Well, I got to get back to the business of making comic books. And so I just love making comics. And I, I just, everybody who's listening, if you have that great comic in you, find a way to get it out, make it the best it possibly can be. And then maybe do something else with it, but make it a great comic book first, right? Make it a great comic. Do you know, I'm going to end this. Do you know that Tim Miller's passion, the guy who directed uh, Deadpool, his passion is to make the authority movie. Yes. That is, yeah. He told that me is, that. Yeah. 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 Well, there you go. I mean, I so it. your some of your earliest work is, is 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 still on deck. Stuff you did 22 years ago, 23 years ago is a director's passion. And that's what we can do as comic book people. That's it's probably the Warren and Brian issues. It's probably the Warren and Brian issues he means, you know. Nope. I'm telling you, you you miss you miscast how great your books are. But you know, a final thing, you must have thought about this before, right? You're living in California. Yeah. The best periods ever at Marvel and DC, Dick Giordano, Jim Shooter, you know what I'm going to say? You know, yes. it's Joe Quesada at Marvel. When a creator is sitting uh, in the big uh, chair... Hard disagree. Hard. Yeah, I, I will not agree with Joe Quesada. So just so you know... Okay, I okay. But, but I, 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 good for I you. Love that. He's good for you. He's good for you. 
But that early Nazis Marvel is pretty sweet. You know, I mean, that's that's one of the peaks, I think, in Marvel, you know. He unlocked anyway, you. He unlocked you. He unlocked you. But but if you look at that sort of period, you know, whenever whenever there's a kind of corporate stiff in the chair, it's boring. Whenever there's a creator, somebody who knows what it's like yes. to draw a page or write a page, yes. it's really exciting. Have you ever, ever considered running DC or Marvel? No. Um, uh, if- Full, full on. Let's say a guy calls me and says, life will have followed your work. I want to come. Yeah. Uh, the internet would in 24 hours burn me to the ground uh, for DC. And, you know, we live in a 50-50 world anyway. 50% hate it, 50% love it. Very few people love I, I, I've told people this. Tell me who your favorite person is and I'll find a group that hates that guy. No, but Rob, Rob here's, yeah. a, here's a fascinating thing somebody at Disney yeah. told me. And they did some market research on this. And do you know comic fans? Less than 5% of comic fans have an active Twitter account, right? And they're starting to realize this is meaningless. This is, I mean, it's really fun, but it's essentially a giant echo chamber, you know? And I the agree. People are, the people who are most passionate about it aren't always correct, you know? So, like, what I think is really missing in comics is a seismic event. And I don't mean a story event. I mean something that really shakes up and you're like, what the hell? You know, like Marvel almost filing for chapter 11, the DC implosion. You know, something that everybody sits up and thinks, yes, something big's going on here and there's a changing of the guard and everything. I think something like you being in charge of DC or Marvel would actually, everybody would be talking about it for a month and that's, so, it's like Michael Keaton being cast as Batman. <laughs> Everybody's kind of like, what? You know, and it, it would be awesome. Yeah, here's what I can tell you. Would I know what to do? Yeah. Do I have a lifetime of DC Comics plans? Yes. yes. Do I know stories I would tell immediately that I believe would grab the attention of everyone and go, holy shit. Yeah. Um, yes. That's not the same as having the job. Everybody has a dream of what they would do. But I'm very practical. And at this point, honestly, Mark, at 55 years old, I don't need the hassle. Um, it- I get to tell my stories. I get to tell my stories. Like, the baggage that comes along with that, it's different yeah. now. Yes, you know, it's different. Um, you These guys, I know, you know, I'll, I'll take it right now. Uh, like, so Didio left and Jim Lee took over and and I, I don't see any, look, I, J- Jim is a great penciler. Mm-hmm. That's what he does the best. Yeah. I met with C.B. Sobolski. Uh, we had dinner and he's so excited. He was going to some meetings on the rides. Mm-hmm. And he was going to go to some entertainment division stuff. And I know for a fact, because CB and I can get caught up in talking comics and three hours later, it's like, where'd three hours go? Yeah. But he loves what he's doing. Mm-hmm. He's embraced. He's like, man, Rob, I'm working over here with the theme park people about Marvel rides. I'm moving here about Marvel interactive. I'm working here. He loves it. Uh, he's very passionate. Whereas like you said, maybe it is the benefit of the doubt is maybe, and uh, certainly enough people who work in DC tell people that they have been under the threat of being fired all the time. Mm -hmm. And in that job, just like at studio positions, my one buddy told me most studio executives, once they get the job, all they want to do is keep the job. And every decision (laughs) they make is to keep the job. Don't, don't take a risk. If you take a risk and that risk bites you, you're losing that chair, that corporate card, I think some of that's going on at DC Comics, and that's sad because Marvel has a track record. Yeah, and and I got to be honest, I don't. Do I have a? Do I have an idea of how to transform DC Comics overnight? I do. I don't have one for Marvel because I figure it's been done so well, you know. But I think we're both in agreement, and we have been for years that DC just needs to get its shit together. Well, Good DC God, feels like, you know, whenever there's a property potential you know where you kind of see a, a rundown area and you think this could be pretty amazing this is a nice doer up or dc feels like yeah. that doesn't it yeah. it's a kind of i don't want to say a slum area but it's it's, it's underused you know undervalued and it's, yes. it's got the potential to be fantastic I, listen from a selfish point of view i'd love to see you do it because i think you've got a brilliant eye well thank I you i mean you, you got alan moore at a retirement to come into supreme and everything you know it's like <laughs> i feel you're very persuasive i, I would love Bro. to see you run in dc so oh, let, let's see what happens Mark, you're very kind. It would be great. It would be fun. It's not happening, but thank you. <laughs> listen, before we go, where can people find you, Rob? Where, where can they get you online? So I Listen to my podcast. You want to know me uh, and you want me to, you know, the thing about my podcast, Mark, it's been on for two and a half years and not one person, not one person has challenged me on anything I've shared yeah. because I read from history. 
I bring the receipts. I read from contracts. I read from old interviews. Yeah. Uh, I've kept all my stuff. And, and I didn't, I didn't really expect it, but like I did a five part episode on heroes reborn and all of the business dynamics and how Jim Lee was trying to run the company at the time yeah. and how Ron Perlman flew out to meet him stuff. No one ever knew in yeah. La Jolla and they were going to maybe relocate Marvel to San Diego. Like I, and I've shared those stories because it's time to tell them. Yeah. But I share comics history, my passion, Rob Observations, the podcast. People should seek out wherever there's podcasts. Rob Observations is there. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. You know, find me. Uh, currently, I'm, I'm splitting my world between my creator-owned stuff and Image Comics. We, we're still celebrating the 30th anniversary of, you know, Image with Profit, with Brigade, with Bloodstrike. I've got a brand new book called Airborne. Uh, and then I've got a kick-ass uh, Deadpool series that's coming out uh, in May of 2023. My plate is full. I love it. This is, uh, th th there's an, there's an, I've been, I've been passing this around and I think you're the same way. I, I, his name is Ian. I don't know what, I don't know his full name, but he wrote the book Atonement mm -hmm. and it got adapted to the Kira Knightley, James McAvoy. Oh, so Ian McEwen. Yeah. Okay. He was on CBS being interviewed yeah. and he, Mark, maybe you have a castle and a manor that is as big as his. But it is an estate. And the CBS guy said, after all these years, you get up and you write every day. Yeah. And 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 with, with the size of your manner and, and the success you've had on clearly where you live, like, yeah. why are you still working? And he said, It's not work, it's my existence. I can't imagine existing without doing this. Writing is part of my existence, making comics is part of my existence. So that is what I'm doing each and every day. Mark, I cannot tell you how much fun I had talking to you. I miss your cute little face. I want to squeeze <laughs> your cheeks. You've got such a cute little smile. And you've got that Scottish, all you guys with the accents, you're even sexier because of the way you talk and you talk like this. Oh, and there's this and that. But nobody and understands the, anything we're saying. No, no I mean, I this is going to be unintelligible. You know? Some of your friends I can't understand. I won't say any names, but one of them <laughs> sounds like this. A hand, a hand, a hand, a hand, a hand. I'm like, what the hell are you saying to me? I don't know. I can understand said, you. The Jerry Conway one last week, everybody thought the sound was off. And it's like, no, that's me. That's actually my voice. You, know, well, so you like... sound great to me. You sound great to me, Mark. Thank you for having me on. Thank Not you. Not at all. Great to see you. And I can't wait to see you in person. Okay. Good to see you. I hope all you see the best. You soon. All right. Take care. Don't forget, that's Magic Order, American Jesus and Prodigy out in November. Coming in January, Nemesis Reloaded with art by Jorge Jimenez. In December, for only $1.99, Nightclub by me and Juan Andromedes. It's going to be brilliant. $1.99, can you believe it?